Hey, free, you stone smoocher. You are a godsend because now watch going to do to you and to your prophet, free. You are barking in the comment section. Now let's see if you have a bite with your bark. Free, call me on Skype right now. Here it is. I told you, now watch what I'm doing to your prophet. I'm going to make your prophet cry from the pit of hell where he's burning under the feet of Jesus. Free, come out, come out, wherever you are. The smooching, the stone's not going to help you now, Free. Free, are you ready? God sent you here. Good. Praise the Lord. All right. Let's go. Free, mute yourself. Mute yourself. Mute the background, dude. All right. Okay, Free, which passage do you want to start with so I can bury Muhammad? Which one? Uh, this isn't Free. Oh, who is it? Um, who is it? Okay, let me try Matt again Hedges. for your dial tone. Who is it? Matt Hedges. Okay, Matt, you're going to have to wait, man. Did you hear oh. me calling Free the Muslim because he's attacking the Trinity? Brother, oh, you know, boy. You're killing me, Matt. Matt okay, you're sorry. Me. I love you, you man. I love you. Listen to the comment section. I'll tell you when you can call me, right? All right. Sounds good. All right, buddy. I'll have to call before 11 because I got to go then. Why, man? Just quit your job. Don't go to sleep. It's okay, bro. You're handsome as it is. You don't need beauty sleep. But let me see if this guy's going to call. If not, I'll call you. tell you call right back. Let me let me see what's up with this guy. All right. All right, brother. God bless. Be right. All right. Free. Where are you? You were barking. What happened? Where's the bike free? I'm waiting for you, buddy. Diego, don't call me now. Hold on. Guys, wait, because we got a Mohammedan who thought these verses are going to refute the Trinity. Each single verse is going to bury Muhammad and expose Allah as a Satan. Free, Yemen, I'm talking to you. Don't ignore me, dude. Okay. Can you call me on Skype, Stone Smoocher? Free Yemeni, are you going to call me or are you going to be a coward in the comment section and I'll take you in the comment section? Oh, he won't? Okay. Free, which passage do you want to start with that I can bury Muhammad? Every one of those passages. Okay, let's start with you said in the Old Testament, prophets did miracles, right? Guys, do me a favor, please. Please. If you're going to respect me, don't engage him. Here's where now you're going to control yourselves. Let me deal with this guy. Because he's a gift from God. I'm going to use him to embarrass Muhammad and glorify Jesus. You said that in the Old Testament, prophets did miracles, right? Free, I'm talking to you. You said, because I'm going to answer you now, respond in the text. You said prophets before Jesus did miracles, right? Okay. Free, I want you to quote either from your Quran or the Old Testament, where any prophet said, I am the resurrection and the life. Quote those verses. Show me where Elijah, Elisha, or even your fake prophet, the son of Satan, said, I am the resurrection and the life when they did a miracle. Calm, calm down, God girl. We're debating a Muslim. Be patient, guys. God sent this man so we can make an example out of him and bury Muhammad and glorify Jesus. Quote the passages where when Elijah, Elisha did a miracle, they said, this miracle proves that I, Elijah, Elisha, am the resurrection and the life. Okay. Free. No, no, no. You're not going to run. You brought those passages. You're not going to bark and run away. You're going to answer questions because I'm answering you. Quote where any of the prophets said, I'm the resurrection life when they did a miracle. They did a miracle to prove that they are the resurrection life. In those words where they say, I'm the resurrection and the life. Or you're wasting my time, and I'm going to really punish Muhammad for producing someone like you. Quote, because you said prophets did miracles. Quote, don't waste our time. So this is a godsend. This is the gift that keeps giving. 
Yes, in my Bible, show me before I embarrass Muhammad for being a filthy pedophile, whore-mongering stone smoocher. I'm going to embarrass your prophet, so don't let me embarrass your prophet. Answer my question. Show me in the Bible where any prophet, Elijah, Elijah, Elisha, said, here, I'm going to do a miracle to prove I'm the resurrection and the life. You came here barking. I'm going to muzzle you and your prophet Muhammad by the glory of Jesus Christ. Muhammad's God and judge. The guy doesn't want to call because he's afraid. What I'm going to do to is Muhammad. So I'm going to do it now in the comment section. Quote, you're wasting time. Quote, show me where Elijah, Elijah said, I'm the resurrection, the life. Okay, let's see if he's going to answer. If not, we're going to block him and we're going to get back. We're going to pray and I'm going to open up to questions and then Michael can call me. This is what they do. They came barking like rabid dogs. And when you come to muzzle them, then you see they have no bite. Can you quote it? Yes or no? You quoted my Bible. I'm going to use my Bible to bury your God and his prophet. Glory to Jesus. My Bible shows that your God is Satan who inspired Muhammad. Hopefully, hopefully you'll repent and turn away from this filthy, immoral man, Muhammad. We're waiting, friend. I'm not going to give you more than a minute. You're wasting our time. I even started early to bury you. One more time before I send you to Mecca. Can you show me where any of the prophets said, I'm the resurrection and the life, when they did a miracle and used the miracle to prove that the resurrection life? See, you keep throwing verses, and every verse I'm going to bury Muhammad further in hell. Are you going to answer? The question related to the passages he raised. He can't answer even a question related to the passages he raised because he's embarrassed of Muhammad. He knows Muhammad is the son of Satan. One more time, I'm answering your question. Count 20 before we bury him with his prophet. 20, 19, 18. You better answer. 17. Oh, my goodness. The buffering is back. Yeah, I'm going to probably have to connect to the router. Please, with my God. I don't know why the buffering is back. Please, my Father. Lord Jesus, we bless it. Pray that the buffering doesn't get bad because I'm going to have to connect to the router. 17, 16, 15, 14. Justice White, I do believe in asking the saints to pray for us. It's called the communion of saints. Justice White, you don't like it? Get out of here. I'm going to block you. Don't start your nonsense. 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. You see what a filthy dog he is? He's a worse dog than Muhammad. He can't answer anything, but he keeps quoting verses. And I'm going to go through those verses and show how they bury Muhammad. You are worse than Muhammad. We know Muhammad is a dog, but you're worse than him. Now go back to your doghouse. Get this guy out of here. This dog. Fake. Fake cowards, man. Get him out of here. Guys, come on, mods. Fast. Let's not waste time. Okay. Anyway, let's ask the Lord to bless and pray that the connection stays strong because I'm not connected to the router modem. Usually it was great. I haven't been connecting the router and motor. It's been phenomenal. But right now, it's been bad. So let's see what happens. And I'm going to open up the Q&A because this is the time to ask me questions. There were some questions I want to answer, but someone called, and he wants to get his question answered before he goes to sleep at 11. So please, Father, we ask for the sake of the Lord Jesus, your Son, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, please, I ask, first of all, that you crucify our flesh, mortify our flesh, and destroy the fruit of the flesh. Give me the power of the Holy Spirit to exercise perfect self-control, self-restraint, not to sin in my anger and cause others to stumble unnecessarily. Please, my Father, for the glory of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ will be honored. May he increase in us, may we decrease. Cleanse us, purify us in the blood of the Lord Jesus. Make us pure and holy in your sight. Fill us with life from the Spirit, fruit from the Spirit, power from the Holy Spirit. And Father, please, in this session, Ask your Holy Spirit to anoint me to recall the passages correctly, not make a mistake in recalling them or misinterpreting them. Save me from error. Anoint me to speak truth from your spirit and bless your people, Father, in Jesus' name, by the power of the Spirit, to understand the answers to the questions and strengthen us to stand more in love with you, more in awe of you, more in love with Jesus, more in awe of Jesus, more in love with your spirit, more in awe with your spirit, and to plunge the depth of Scripture 
and bring out the meat of Scripture and live it out by the power of your Holy Spirit. Flood us in the blood of Jesus. Flood us in your living waters, Father. <clears throat> Fill my throat and my chest and my lungs with the breath of life, the health I need to glorify you and please, Bobby. Give me power. Give me victory to crucify my flesh, to exercise perfect self-control, all of us, and strengthen us to be spiritually disciplined, engaging in intense spiritual exercises, worshiping you, praying to you, singing to you, studying the word, meditating upon the word, reciting it, proclaiming it, and living it, and worshiping in community. We need you, and we love you, Father. We need you, Son of God, Lord Jesus, we need you. Bless this session. Holy Spirit, take over, please, as you did in the previous session. And please save me from Aaron's stammering and confusion, and bless them, Holy Spirit. Illuminate them, Holy Spirit, and guide this conversation. Make me bold as a lion. Make us bold as lions and lionesses, and as well as compassion, loving, and merciful, and patient for the glory of Jesus. Destroy distractions of Satan and bless this connection. Holy Spirit, take over, please. We need you for the glory of Jesus. Purify my motives, not to do it for the praise of men or for money or fame, but for the glory and honor of Jesus Christ. Bless them. Bless us. Bless me, Holy Spirit. Bless our loved ones. Bless my daughters for the glory of Jesus, because we love you, Spirit. We love you, Son of God. We love you, Father. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Yahweh, the Father, Son, Spirit. Yahweh, the Father, Son, Spirit. Wash us, purify us in the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb. Before you call me on Skype, hopefully, last time we had about 260. It was a good crowd. I don't want to lose people, but I don't want jerks. I don't want people here just to be entertained or to get into side issues or pontificate their attack. That's what I don't want. I want quality people, but a lot more. For the glory of Jesus, Lord, have your way and bring them. Now, a prayer request for our precious sister, Louisa. Louisa, are you here? Is our sister here? Louisa, are you here? What happened in the previous session, Ariel, when Carolina got muted for a comment? What comment was it? Because I read you said, Carolina, if you post that again, I'll block you. Okay, guys, can you do me a favor? The Lord Jesus has blessed me by giving me the grace and honor of being a teacher to this young lady, Louisa. You see her name. It is an honor when the Holy Spirit answers people's prayers, when they see God's face, and then he brings them to those teachers that God will use in the lives of those who hunger for him. And as she sought the Lord and prayed, the Lord in his mercy brought her to my YouTube channel to use me, a wicked failure and sinner, who needs the blood of Jesus to be purified and the spirit to be sanctified, to teach her. So it's been a joy to serve her and teach her because she's fallen so passionately in love with Jesus. Pray for her, her husband and children. She is a blessing to me. All of you are. When you come here and I see that you're hungry for the word and in love with Jesus and are growing in love with Jesus. She's right here, Louisa Campbell. Now, I guess she lives on a farm and she has animals. Now, to you, it may be funny. It's not funny to me because if you guys have animals, especially dogs, dogs become like family members. Now, she has a pig. His name is Mr. Bland. She had to take him today to the doctor because it seems he might have, you know, septic from bacterial infection. See, now, when you, when you raise animals, when you raise animals, they become family, horses, cows, pigs. Pray for Mr. <clears> – <throat> let me look at the name again. She just sent me a message. Because, remember, God's animals, these are God's animals. God created these animals. He loves his animals. He does. Every creature that God made, he loves. He loves his creation. He loves the pigs. He loves – and this is true. He loves animals. He created them, and he loves them. And he created them for our benefit, for our joy, for our pleasure, right? So his name is Mr. Bland. Can you pray that the Lord Jesus will have mercy on her and her family by having mercy on this creation of Jesus, this beautiful creation of Jesus, Mr. Bland, this beautiful creation, a pig that Jesus created. And whatever Jesus creates, it's beautiful. Nothing was created bad or evil. Everything created by the triune God, when it was created, it was created beautiful. It is the sin of Satan and sin of man that has corrupted this beautiful creation. So ask the Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, Son of God, please bless Mr. Bland. Heal him and destroy this bacterial infection in order to cause Louisa's heart, the heart of her husband and children, to rejoice 
that you're such a good God that you even love the animals you created. In Jesus' name, please, Lord, by faith we come. Purify us, purify Luis and her family in the blood of Jesus and heal this beautiful creature, Mr. Bland, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Father, Son, Spirit. Let me give you a verse that goes with this. Proverbs 12, verse 10. Proverbs 12, verse 10. Naked man in the shroud and Mark. I have no idea what you're talking about here. Proverbs 12, verse 10. Watch here. Protestant, you here or you, did, you got raptured here? Guys, read this. A righteous man regardeth the life of his beast, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. I wish I could do a session on this, but I want you to pay attention to the first part of the verse. A righteous man regardeth the life of his beast. Now, Slam gave another translation. Whoever is righteous has regard for the life of his beast. Did you catch it? Now, guys, Protestant will post. Thank you. God bless you. You see what it says? Those who belong to Jesus and are righteous by the grace of Jesus even love and have compassion for their animals. How much more for fellow humans? Did you catch it? Proverbs 12, verse 10. A righteous man... Has even concern for his animals, his beast. How much more concern will he have for his fellow human? Is this Bible beautiful or what? Is it beautiful or what, man? And you want to see that God cares for his animals? Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. Watch here. Luis, I hope those verses moved you by the Spirit, and the Spirit moved you to see. God loves the animals that he's entrusted to your care. Proverbs 25, verse 4. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn. You know what that means? God is telling the Israelites, Slam, sister, your sister, right? Because I think you're sister. Please don't post for me, Protestants. I know you're helping me. Help me. I love you, sister. God bless you. Let him do it. Because too many people post, I get confused. Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. Did you catch it? Deuteronomy 25, verse 4, right? You should not muzzle ox when it's treading out the grain in this version. Okay. Thank you, guys. Super chatters, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for your gifts. Lord bless you, and I pray in Jesus' name I'll collect them sooner than later. Thank you, you super chatters. All right. I hope that moved you, Luisa. The Spirit moved you. The How real the Bible is. It even has passages that speak about the care of your animals. Now, let me explain Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. Let me explain Deuteronomy 25, 4. And I pray the Lord Jesus helps me to get my health back healthier and holier and beatifies me for his glory. Please, Lord. Okay. What God is telling the Israelites is, even when you have an ox that treads the fields for you, don't you be so wicked to put a muzzle to prevent the ox from eating from the ground. If that ox is working for you, that ox deserves to be fed. Don't you dare be cruel to an ox. Now, God shows this much compassion to an animal. How much more compassion will he show you, his children? Right? Exactly, Alan Grove, even in the Ten Commandments. Okay, so everyone clear? Now, that said, this brother called me. Brother Michael, go ahead, call me. I'll see if I can answer your question. Now, pray for me to be anointed by the Spirit to answer correctly. Right? Because I'm trusting the Spirit to perfect my ability to recall passages. Go ahead, brother. You can call. The brother just call. It's not 11 yet, so call me. Hey. Man, that, that noise scares the heck out of me. Woo! Scares me, man. What's up, brother? Hi. Hi. If I can, uh, yes. Go ahead, brother. What's your question, if I can answer? Yes. My question is um, something that Shabir Ali brought up in your debate with him. Oh, you did, huh? Man, that was my yeah. first public um, debate. That's years ago, dude. What's wrong yeah. with you? By the way, it was uh, about um, evolution of Christology in the Gospels, where he basically said that Mark ten eighteen, when it's yeah. in Mark, it's talking about Jesus says, "Why do you call me good?" But in Matthew, it says, "Why do you ask me about what is good?" Sure. Says, yeah, yeah, he brought that up, huh? That was in my debate. Uh, by the way, I just wanted to mention something real quick. Yes. I know that you've been talking. Do you know? Are you familiar with the Muslim apologist Zakir Hussein? Yeah, that guy, the one who's insane to the membrane, who's a joke. Yeah. Yeah, ahead. I recently posted an article where we go through every single of his arguments and his debate with Dr. James White on the crucifixion and. Um, what's yeah. your What's your website, man? Let me promote you, bro. 
Uh, it's called, just search up Soli Deo Gloria Apologetics oh. blog. Okay. Soli Deo Gloria Apologetics blog. Can you make it a little longer next time? <laughs> no, all right. Guys, here's another young man. Another young man who is on fire for Jesus, and he's doing his part to advance the kingdom. What's your name, brother? Uh, my name is Matt. Matt. The, the blog is Soli Deo Gloria blog. And if you guys don't know, that's Latin for solely for the glory of God. Brethren, you need to support these apologists. This man is the next generation. If the Lord tarries, and I'll probably die today, better than better leaving the world. We need to support and pray for these young lions and lionesses. Soli Deo Gloria blog. Matt, pray for him, that God will strengthen him, and that his faith will get stronger, not weaker, for the glory of Jesus. Now, do you want to stay on, or do you want to hear it while... You're off the phone. Do you want to hear me as you want to stay on the phone as I say this, or do you want to just get off and I'll answer it? Sure. Just like, so do you think, how do you answer just about Mark 10, 18 yes. in its comparison with Matthew? Do you think the author of Matthew was like embarrassed about this, trying to elevate Jesus? Um, well, if he's embarrassed about it, he did a bad job of hiding because there are two issues involved, my brother. This is something I want to encourage you to do. I want you to go encourage you to study. That doesn't mean, see, again, you can be a jack of all trades and a master of one. Or you can specialize in one specific area and fully perfect that area and be used by God in that area to shine for the glory of Christ. Because not all of us can be experts in every field. Like atheism, I don't debate atheist or evolution. That's not my field. God has raised up people for that purpose. But part of your apologetics will require that you do at least study the experts and scholars in the field of textual criticism. The issue has to go with which family of manuscripts do you prioritize? Because the reading you're giving me is based on earlier witnesses to Matthew, and you said the author of Matthew. Now, I hope you don't assume Matthew didn't write Matthew, because that would be the influence of liberal critical scholarship. Because as far as we can go back, even the names attached to the extent copies of the Gospels, when, when they attach names to the copies of the Gospels, you'll find that Matthew has always been the Gospel according to Matthew, and the earliest evidence has been that Matthew wrote. Now, there are church fathers who say that Matthew originally wrote the Logia, the words of Jesus, in Hebrew. And then people translated it accordingly into Greek. What does that mean? Does that mean that Matthew wrote his gospel narrative in Hebrew? Or does that mean he took down the sayings of Jesus, the proclamations of Jesus, wrote them in Hebrew, and then later wrote his gospel? That is a debate. However, there is no debate that the gospel according to Matthew has always been attributed to Matthew. There hasn't been any question about authorship until the rise of post-enlightenment critical scholarship. You with me there, right? You following me? Yeah. Okay, yeah. because so you said like, the I mean, author of Matthew. think that uh, Matthew was written first. Yeah, but you said until, the author, yes. Yeah. And again, there is no conclusive evidence that shows Matthew wasn't written first. Just because Mark is shorter and Matthew is longer... That doesn't mean that Matthew expanded Mark. Mark may have given us a sum summarized, succinct version of Matthew. These are all theories, but they're not based on solid fact. But I don't have a problem with Mark being first. What I'm trying to let you know is you need to be a discerning <clears throat> reader and a discerning thinker, not just simply toe the party line. Just because today they tell you Mark is first. Why? Because Mark is shorter and Matthew is longer and there's material of Mark and Matthew? Well, how do you know that it's not Mark that wrote a condensed, summarized version of Matthew? In other words, there are too many theories, too many arguments for and against any and every position. But I just want to be clear because I don't know where you're coming from. Do you believe Matthew wrote it or some author wrote the Gospel of Matthew? I think that there's some pretty good evidence and arguments um, to be made for uh, Matthew and authorship. Good, good. I mean, right. Ian I Carson has written some stuff on oh, this. Yeah, okay, I just was, I, it doesn't matter. Even if you didn't believe it, I'm not going to pick on you on that. I just want, because you said the author of Matthew. Let's just go with the traditional view of authorship, and there's no good evidence against it. In fact, you don't find any competing names for authorship. And just let me make another side point about authorship real quickly, because I'm going to answer your question. I'm not trying to get off tangents, but because you asked such a good question that involves me unpacking a lot of issues related to your question by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, here, if the church were inventing names, you would expect that at least in the case of Mark and Luke, they would have found better names of authors 
because Mark is only famous because the gospel is attributed to him. If there wasn't a gospel attributed to Mark, nobody would be talking about Mark. No one would even know who Mark is. No one would care. As we find among the Gnostic gospels of the second and third and fourth centuries, what do we find them doing when they're concocting a gospel, forging a gospel? They attribute it to a well-known apostle, not to a follower of an apostle, because they realize if they can convince someone that an apostle wrote this, then that would perhaps persuade them to read their gospel and believe it's authoritative. In other words, the practice of forgers is to attribute their writings to well-known apostles. But here in the case of Mark and Luke, two of the gospels are attributed to people who are not apostles, but believed to be companions of the apostles. And yet the only reason why they're famous is because gospels are attached to their names. If there wasn't a gospel of Luke, who would be talking about Luke? Who would care about Luke? Who would even think about Luke? Same thing with Mark. The very fact these names were cho chosen actually argues for their veracity that the early church was not making up names, but they're trying to faithfully ascribe the writings to those who actually composed them. Now, that's a side issue. Now, coming back to the issue of Matthew, you're, you're basing the argument, as Shabir Ali is, on the earlier witnesses of Matthew, where there's a difference. In the Matthean version, it says that the rich man asked him, good master, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Okay? Whereas if you read the later copies of Matthew, which are the majority, it doesn't say that. It agrees with Mark. Now you have to explain the difference. Is it because some later scribe tried to harmonize Matthew with Mark? Right? Or... Did Matthew originally read like Mark, but for some reason during the transmission, it was changed to have the rich man emphasize the good things he must do to inherit an eternal life. What's the issue? What's the answer? My encouragement is this is why you need to study the textual transmission and study where the evidence points to. Is it the earlier witnesses that should be prioritized, just like Daniel Wallace and others believe, or should we take into consideration the majority of witnesses, which though from a later period have a higher degree of uni uniformity and have a basis in the ancient textual transmission because these manuscripts came from somewhere and they're based on predecessors. That's something for you to study. It, obviously, I can't, I can't talk about it here, but let's go with Matthew said that the reading in Matthew is, good master, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Is that a change? Because Matthew was embarrassed by what he found Mark? Absolutely not. Because if he's embarrassed, then he did a ja bad job of covering over the fact that still in the Matthean version, you have Jesus saying, why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who's good. Now, how does that soften the impact? I've never thought about that one before. So think about that. Listen yeah. to my one of the Matthew 19, 17. He goes on to say, why do you ask about what is good for there's only one who's good? How does that soften the impact? He still says God alone is good. Sure. Okay, but secondly, is it a case of Matthew softening it or Matthew emphasizing the question? What good commandments? Now, again, when we say Matthew, it almost assumes that he's making it up. And that also goes into literary genre and how ancient biographies and histories were written. That's another issue. But... When I say Matthew, obviously, I don't believe Matthew makes things up because here's an actual oral tradition that Matthew is employing. But is he obligated to quote it word for word or can he sum it up, give us the gist of it in order to highlight a specific point, the point in which Jesus addresses? What good things must you do to inherit eternal life? Because the focus is on what to do to inherit eternal life. In other words, it's not a saying that was made up wholesale. It is an actual saying of Jesus that Matthew has shaped for theological purposes. So the question is, does Matthew have the right, even by inspiration, to take the sayings of Jesus and shape them in a manner to bring out the gist of Jesus' point and do so in an accurate manner that has God's approval and inspiration? Well, we don't have an arti artificial definition of inspiration, meaning I don't just come up with what inspiration is. I must look at the New Testament corpus and then see how the writers wrote their compositions and then conclude how God inspired the writings. 
not come up with a definition of inspiration and then impose it on the writings. But look at the writings, how they were composed, how they were written, how they were preserved, and then draw my view of inspiration from what we have, not impose an artificial definition of inspiration on what we have, like David Wood does. I'm just kidding. He's here, so I'm taking a shot. Am I clear so far? Yeah. Thank you for answering, Mr. Schmoot. Well, you call me Sam, dude. You make me feel old and you make me feel I'm like kidding. a dictator <laughs> like David Wood, Hater Wood. Yeah. And he's here, by the way. Now, Hater Wood. You got a young man named Matt. He has a blog called Soli Deo Gloria blog. He's responding to Muslims such as Sakhar Hussein. Maybe you need to promote the ministry of this young man for the glory of Jesus instead of hogging all the attention to yourself and invite him on your session where 1,500 people come and you put them asleep and you speak 99% of the time. Promote this man, hater. It's not about you. So are you sure that answered your question or you want me to further elaborate? I think that answers my question for now. Thank you, brother. Lord be with you and watch over you. God bless. All right. For the rest of you, I was talking very fast, but I was trying to be as clear as possible. Did I lose any of you in the answer to that question, or is that clear? Did I, did I lose any of you? Well, then that means you should stop promoting your own YouTube channel because you're here in my live stream, in my comment section, Acts 17 Apologetics. I thought you were a logician. Did you not just realize you committed a logical fallacy exposing your consistency, sir? So why are you here in my live stream, in my comment section? Therefore, you got to stop promoting yourself. Busted, Whitey. We busted you, white man. Sucker. All right. We just we just busted Whitey. <laughs> he thought he was the man. What's up, baby? It's a shame. Wait, what's the one with my heart? It's a shame. The way. By the way, for anyone else. Did I lose any of you in this discussion? Did I lose any of you in this discussion? Or was it clear? Oh, that's good. Now, notice how he just contradicted himself. Because he doesn't watch my terrible ice streams. He just shows up. He doesn't listen. Well, if he's not listening, how did he listen and know what I just said for him to respond back to me. See, we just caught him in another logical fallacy, guys. We just busted Whitey. Bam, you got busted, sucker. If you ain't listening, how did you know what I just said to respond back? Sucker. Sucker MC, call me sire. Ah, uh, all right. With that said, okay. <laughs> See, notice here. Okay, with that said, any other questions? Because I have questions to answer. Someone asked me about the prosperity gospel. You know what? Let me defer the prosperity the question about the prosperity gospel to a future session, right? Let's talk about it some other time. But let's see. Diego, did you have a question? If you have a question, go ahead. Call me, sir. Let me just call me, but don't call me, sir. Yes, Alan, you can, brother. But I think Diego's going to beat you to it. Okay. Luke 1. St. Dennis, that's easy to answer. I'll answer that in a minute, St. Dennis. Let me see if Diego's going to call me. Okay. St. Dennis, make sure you repeat that question because I wrote an article on that. Hey, friend. Hey, Sam. Hey, brother. Hey, Alan. That's you, brother. I thought it was Diego. You see, you, you psyched me out, sir. Go ahead. Oh, I apologize if I did that. But um, uh, I, I, I just want to let you know I've been praying for you, man. I just I hope it, that uh, things go well with your daughters and your family. I need it, brother. In Jesus' name, he bless you. You guys know Alan Ruhl. He's got the YouTube channel, Alan Ruhl, and a blog. I've spoken on his YouTube channel. I've done two sessions with him. So subscribe to his YouTube channel. Go to his blog. Read his material. God is Weston. He's one of these up-and-coming Roman Catholic apologists. And you know who you need to partner with? I keep telling him. Uh, he needs to get involved in apologetics, and he's considering it. Ariel Gonzalez. He's a young, bright man. You should team up with him and do something together and encourage him to get his feet wet in apologetics because he's very knowledgeable. But for some reason, he doesn't do it. I don't know what it is, man. Go ahead and encourage him. Well, good, brother. What's your question? Uh, well, you, you kind of touched on this with uh, in your last live stream with David Wood. And I've been thinking of doing a video about this myself. But I just want to uh, just ask your opinion about it. Uh, it's about spiritual maturity. At, at what state after someone becomes a true believer – should they get involved in apologetics? Oh, yeah. How much time should they spend building their spiritual Excellent. life before that? Excellent. 
Yeah, excellent question. Now, number one, you and I both know, and you know this very well, spiritual maturity is actually a work of the grace of the Holy Spirit. And the more we yield to the Holy Spirit, the more we submit to the Holy Spirit, the more mature we become. And that's why, Alan, you know this as well as I do. You can have someone in the faith 50 years and still does not have the spiritual maturity to do what we're doing, right? Yeah. And yet we find people that come in the faith within five years and they're spiritual dy uh, you know, dynamo, dynamite, dynamos, right? So number yeah. one, it's not really a time because that's up to the Holy Spirit. And what I see from Scripture, the more someone yields to the Spirit, the more someone seeks the face of the Holy Spirit, the more someone obeys the Spirit and does what the Spirit asks, the faster they grow. Because spiritual maturity is not like physical maturity. See, everyone is born. If I'm born 1972, I'm going to grow at the same rate that someone else is born in 1972, meaning physically, in my physical stature, right? Now, mentally, I may be smarter. Intellectually, I may be smarter, but I'm talking about physically. If you're born in 1972 and I'm born in 1972, and we don't have any physical ailments or handicaps, you and I are going to be two in the same year, right? 19, you know, 1974. But with spiritual growth, that's up to the Holy Spirit. You can have a person who's in the faith five years and he has a spiritual maturity of someone who's been in the faith for 50 years. And you can have someone who's in the faith 50 years and still not spiritually mature. It's still on milk. He's still on milk. And you find that even in Hebrews. If you go to Hebrews 5, verses 11 and 14, even Paul, because tradition says Paul wrote it. He may have used an amanuensis. He says that you guys should be teaching, but you're still on milk right now. Hebrews 5, verses 11 and 14, right? He's chiding them. All these years you've been in the faith, and you're still on milk when you should be teachers. So I don't put a time frame. That depends on how much you're yielding to the Spirit, how closely you walk in union with the Spirit. That will impact and affect how fast you grow spiritually. Now, that said, I do not encourage someone to do apologetics if they're not grounded in at least the core doctrines of the Christian meaning. They have a working knowledge of why they believe in the Trinity, what's the biblical basis for the Trinity, why they believe, let's say, in the two-natured Christ, the hypostatic union, what's the biblical basis for it, the authority of Scripture, the transmission of Scripture, the preservation of Scripture. I'm not saying you got to be an expert, but at least a working knowledge in these areas and be convinced of the authority of Scriptures and these doctrines so that now you can make a case and in, in in case someone raises an objection you're not familiar with, it won't shake your foundation and cause you to doubt. What that will do is encourage you to go back and find the answer and then grow and become stronger in your faith. So you have to have a working knowledge of the essentials of the faith. Now, depending on your tradition, that can mean also not just the Trinity, right? The deity of Christ. It can be other doubt. Like from your tradition, from your background, you have to know why you believe, for example, in the primacy of the Pope. You have to also know why you believe in doctrines like purgatory because they're going to come up because you're not just dealing with non-Christian groups. You're dealing with other Christians who do not agree with you, and you need to know why you believe this and what your evidence is because you got Orthodox, you got Roman Catholic, you got Coptic, you got Nestorians and a variety of flavors of Protestants. You see? So specifically, depending on your affiliation, if you're a Roman Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, we have core doctrines in common that we share in common be convinced and grounded in those core doctrines that we hold in common then also have a working knowledge of those particular traditions that are unique to your tradition and why you believe them so that when you're challenged and you engage you are able to give a response and if there's someone who brings a counter response at least you're grounded enough to know this is true even though I don't have the answer to this, there's going to be an answer, and I'll find the answer. That would be my advice. I don't know if that okay. answered it. I hope I don't hope I didn't do a bad job, but I I don't know if that answered it. Well, well uh, uh, I, I I was kind of asking uh, specifically for a timeline, but I think I the can't response give you, one, you yeah. gave me was good. Yeah. Oh, what? I'm sorry. I can't give a timeline because that's going to depend on the person's spiritual maturity, and the more you yield to the spirit, some people grow leaps and bounds within four or five years. I mean, here, I'm not trying to use myself as an example, but I'm going to tell you my own experience. I came into the faith late 90s, and by 1999, I was already doing full-time ministry and engaging these topics with Muslims. 
Yeah, because I think you debated Shabir Ali in 1999. But no, that's good because I was asking for a timeline, but you kind of explained it that it's not so much about timeline as because people m- mature uh, spiritually not at the same rate. It's not like how many years you've been alive. Yes. Because two years, we all grow two years, right? But in terms of spiritual maturity, that's that's something else. Yeah, no, I think you... Uh, think, think about it, Alan. Let me ask you a question. It. Alan, how many of the priests that you know could engage a Shabir Ali? Uh, none. Okay. How many priests you know could answer these basic objections against the Trinity that we, we were asked day in and day out? Uh, probably, probably all of them. Okay, so that's good, at least when it comes to that. All right. So here you're saying you have some priests that can't answer these typical. For example, how would you? How do you think a priest would answer a question such as Jesus not knowing the day or hour? Yeah, he would, could tell you because he's too natured. But he could he go beyond that and go into the scriptures and bring out the depth of scriptures to show his answer is biblically based and not simply what he believes because of his particular tradition. That's what I'm asking. Well, well, like, uh, like for example, I don't know if you know this, but but Catholic priests have about two hours w- worth of reading and prayers they do every day in something called the uh, breviary. Mm. And I know in the breviary, it's got a lot of church fathers in it. Uh, and I know St. Basil of Caesarea is quite often in the breviary, and he has a good response to that. So I, do, I don't pray the breviary myself. I mean, you technically don't need to be a priest to pray it, but yeah. all priests pray it every day. Yeah. Um, so maybe they come across that, but I know there's a lot of um, yeah. stuff found in the the breviary. I just haven't yeah. read it myself. So, but, uh, it, oh, don't forget, Alan. You can recite something and still not understand it. We see that with Muslims, and I'm care- I'm not comparing them to Muslims, right? But you got Muslims who recite. The Quran and have no even people in Arabic whose mother tongue is Arabic and they still don't understand it. And that's not saying the same case, but still, you get the point. You can have people who've been in it for years, but haven't been challenged to go deep. Now, if you're a you're an apologist, that's a different story. You bring a Trent Horn or you bring a Scott Hahn or you bring a Patrick Madrid, because what do they do? They were grounded in their faith and then they engaged people of different viewpoint and they were forced to dig deeper and perfect their understanding of these things. So, again, to repeat, you have to have a working knowledge of the core doctrines of the faith, and then you need to engage to be challenged so you can go deeper and then perfect your understanding of these things, and then you'll see. You'll become a mighty weapon in the hands of God. I mean, look, it's happening with you, right? Since you started engaging apologetics, hasn't it made an amazing impact on you? Yeah, no, that's true. And uh, I, I contacted, like, before I started my website in 2015, I I even sent an email to uh, to John Salza, a well-known oh, Catholic. Oh, yeah, he's, yeah I know him, too. Yeah, I've been following him, too. He wrote some books on masonry, too, refuting masonry. Yeah, yeah he's a former Freemason. Praise God for him. And, um, an inside guy. And, and so, like, I talked to him, and he says it back. He's like, uh, you know, just get started, but no, it's all about prayer you know Hallelujah. so it's all about the spiritual Amen. life and that's really the foundation for everything else you've got the prayer life going and everything else follows easily and that that's simply another way of me saying yielding to the holy spirit right amen right then i say the more you yield to the holy spirit the more maturity you'll experience and you'll be sharpened and perfected that's basically what it is because when you're praying true prayers that delight heart the heart of god our prayers moved by the Spirit, the Spirit moving you and praying through you in accord with God's will. So that's the same thing I said. Yield to the Spirit, and the more you yield to the Spirit and do those spiritual disciplines that the Holy Spirit has given us, then you'll grow leaps and bounds, and you're going to be a warrior. And you're proof. You just started doing apologetic couple years, but you've grown leaps and bounds. Okay? Mm-hmm. But you already had, you were still, before you did apologetics, and I'll leave you with this, and if you have another question, feel free to ask. Before you did apologetics, you were grounded in your tradition, right? You you knew, mm-hmm. you knew what you believed, and you have no doubt about your tradition and the Trinity. So now that you had that foundation, now that you're doing apologetics, you're growing leaps and bounds. So I would recommend someone has to at least be assured of their faith. If you're weak and you're not strong and you're not convinced of your faith, be strengthened in those areas and then jump into the lion's den knowing that the God of Daniel will shut the mouths of lions as you proclaim Christ crucified. 
but you need to then engage because I promise you folks, the more you engage unbelievers after you are grounded in the core doctrines of faith and have no doubt about them, you will become so much stronger. You'll be so much more bold and strengthened in your faith that by the time you're done, your faith will be able to move mountains because God will show you wonders and show you that your faith is based on the truth and have no doubt about it. That's the point I'm at right now. Slam RN. I don't know if you've been following me long enough. I have absolutely no problem with Roman Catholic apologists or Orthodox. I'm not of that school that thinks that none of them are saved. I've changed my position. If that hurts you, my sister, there are other channels for you. I'm sorry. I don't mean to disappoint you, but I'm not here to tickle your ears. I love you, sister, but not that much. Just kidding. Alan, you have another question, brother? Feel free to ask. Um... No, that's pretty much all. And I just want to thank you so much for doing these live streams. These thank are, uh, I mean, if you want to do apologetics, some something I would say to everyone is tune into these live streams as much as possible because mm -hmm. they're great for Bible study. You get the meat. That's what I like. You don't Praise just get a, a proof text. You get the meat behind the proof text. Hallelujah, because I'm, I love buffets, man. In fact, I went to a buffet today and I got sick, so I'm recovering. So I got to be careful. Too much meat's not good for me, bro. All right. All right. I'll see you later, Sam. I'm going to keep watching, but thank you so much for taking my question. God bless you, brother. Watch over and prosper for his glory. Umberto, uh, I just did a series on this, man. Umberto, you, uh, was it Umberto asked me? I'm a little confused. Umberto asked me, can you explain, talk about John 10, 34, 36, and Psalm 82? Brother, I just did a series on John 10, 33 to 39. I also did a series in re response to Mike Kaiser. It's on my YouTube channel. But just last two weeks, I did a series on John 10, 33, 39. But I may answer that again. Now, before I do that, some people ask some good questions. Someone asked about Acts 21, 26. Let me see what it was. That's another good question. Controversial one, nonetheless. But let me see. Yeah, Jesus Christ is Lord. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, Muslim raised that. I may answer that. But Diego, did you want to call? Oh, yeah, and St. Dennis. Three good questions. But I'm going to give Diego a chance to call me because if he doesn't, once I take a question from the comment section, hold back on calling me on Skype because I don't want to answer a question and be, be interrupted. So, Diego, you want to call because you told me when you want to call. It's a chance to call. If not, I'm going to take St. Dennis's question first. Luke 1, verses 4 to 5, specifically verse 6. I guess not. I guess he's not. Okay, Diego, I think you're gone, brother. Okay, guys, do me a favor. I'm going to answer Luke 1, verses 4 to 5. So please don't call me until I finish the answer. Then I'll tell you to call, okay? So I can help this young man with Luke 1, verses 4 to 5. Okay, Luke 1, verses 4 to 5. Restate your question, St. Dennis. Restate your question. Slam, if, you're, if your conviction is that in your Protestant denomination you found the true faith, that's fine. I'm not condemning you. But please, if I don't agree with you, don't condemn me. I'm at a point where I have a different understanding and perspective. You can text your question, Michael, here, or you can text it on Skype either way. But what was St. Dennis's question? Yeah, Zachary, don't call me yet. Let me finish the answer then. Well, St. Dennis, let me actually make it harder for me and you. Let's read Luke 1, verse 6. Luke 1, verse 6. Okay. I'm, gonna, I'm going to articulate the objection. St. Dennis, let's read. Okay. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinance of the Lord blameless. St. Dennis, did you catch it? Zechariah and Elizabeth. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous before God because they tried their best to obey the commands and they were blameless before the Lord. See, they were saved apart from Jesus. Is that the objection? Guys, you got to listen to this because I wrote an article on this. Guys, remind me to give you the link to this article because this was an arg argument raised by Paul Williams, who used to be a Muslim, who's longer a Muslim. How can these individuals be righteous how can these individuals be righteous by observing the law without the death of Christ if what we believe is true? Everyone with me there? Here's the objection. Luke 1, 6 says, Zechariah and his wife, righteous before God and blameless in obeying the commandments, meaning that they didn't need Jesus to be saved because the law was sufficient. 
Okay, do you guys understand the, the, the question? So I can respond to the objection. Everyone understand? So I can now answer for your benefit. Because Luke 1.6 is something that everyone needs to know. All right. Everyone with me? Everyone got it? Please, guys. Let me know if you got it. All right. Number one. St. Dennis, engage me, interact with me, and everyone else. Number one, Zechariah or Zacharias, the Greek is Zacharias, was a priest, correct? He was a priest. And if you read Luke 1, he was in the temple officiating as a priest when angel Gabriel appeared to him. So what does that mean? As a priest, Zechariah would know that God had prescribed through the law, law various sacrifices to cover over his sin. So when it says he's righteous and blameless, that's because though a sinner who felt short, he would do what the law prescribed by repenting and offering sacrifices to cover over sins until Jesus came. So even in that context, it shows that being blameless before God comes from an acknowledgement that you're a sinner, that you fail God, and you need to repent and ask God to forgive you and he forgives you on the basis of the sacrificial system. The sacrifice is prescribed to cover over your infractions, whether your sins are intentional and unintentional. And if you do that, then God views you as blameless. Okay? Are you with me there? Because you're doing all that God requires so that your sins can be atoned and God doesn't credit your sin against you but reckons you blameless. Okay, that's number one. Number two, Frank, I got your question, brother. Be patient, brother. Frank, I love you. You have an Italian name? Come on, Paisan. Just be patient. Let me finish one at a time. Okay, now, number two, that Zacharias is not sinless, but weak and sinful. Is it not true, St. Dennis, that in that very chapter, Zechariah doubted Gabriel? And because he doubted, he was struck mute and was not allowed to speak until John was born. Does that sound like someone sinless, St. Dennis? Does that sound like someone is sinless, St. Dennis? All right. That's number two. Number three. Number three. When Zechariah was allowed to speak, when his son John was born, the Holy Spirit opened his mouth. And the Holy Spirit filled him to break out in praise. So let's see what his Holy Spirit filled praise says about salvation. Luke 1, 67 to 69. Luke 1, 67 to 69. No, Gold. I'm answering the question, Gold, if you pay attention. Pay attention because these are excellent questions and you're going to be sharpened in your faith. Luke 1, 67 to 69. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. God is now visiting us to redeem us. 69, St. Dennis. And hath raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. God has now raised up a king, a ruler, to bring salvation from the house of David, prophesying about Jesus, who's from the house of David. Now Luke 1, 76 to 77. Luke 1, 76 to 77. This is Zechariah filled with the Holy Spirit prophesying over the birth of his son and his son being the forerunner of the horn of salvation from the house of David, meaning Jesus. Here, Luke 1, 76 to 77. And thou, child, my son, you, my child, shall be called the prophet of the highest. For thou shalt go, you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. So the same chapter tells us that Zechariah is aware his son is the forerunner of the Lord Messiah, and he's going to tell people that the way of salvation and remission of sins is by believing in him. Are you with me there? Did that make sense? St. Dennis? Before I move on? So you mean that same chapter goes on to tell us that Zechariah is aware that he is only blameless and righteous because of God's mercy in forgiving his sins 
and covering them over by the sacrificial system until Messiah came would not just cover sins but remove them? That same chapter? Now let's go to Luke 10, 2. What do the angels tell the shepherds in the field? Luke 2, 10 to 11. Luke 2, 10 to 11. You see how easy it is to refute falsehood and affirm truth? Who's calling me no caller ID? Silly, right? People calling me no caller ID unknown. Luke 2, 10, verse 10 and 11. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Which is Christ the Lord. A Savior? Why do they need a Savior? I thought they're blameless. What does John say? Who is John? Luke 3, verses 1 to 6. Luke 3, verses 1 to 6. Is it making sense to the rest of you? A lot of good questions. Luke 3, verses 1 to 6. Now, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being Tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, te Tetrarch of Uteria, Uteria, man, these names, woo, and the region of Trachonitis, 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 Bronchitis, anyway, and Lysenius, Lysenius, the Tetrarch of Abilene, Abilene. Now watch. Okay. Watch here. Verses 2 all the way to 6. Annas, or Anna, Annas, or Annas, and Caiaphas being the high priest, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now watch who John is, who John the Baptist is. What role does he fulfill? As it is written... In the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So John is the voice who cries in the wilderness. Guys, be prepared. Make paths, the paths of the Lord straight. Prepare ye for the Lord. The Lord Jehovah is coming. That's who John is. The voice telling people, get ready. The Lord Jehovah is coming. Make his path straight. straight. Every valley shall be filled. And every mountain, every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough way shall be made smooth. Now verse 6, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Let that sink in. According to Luke, who is John the Baptist? The voice of Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 and 5. The voice in the wilderness shouting and preparing people, Make the way of the Lord straight, because the Lord is coming. The Lord Job is coming, and all flesh will see the salvation of God. The Lord is coming to give salvation. Who is the Lord God that brings salvation that John prepares for? Luke 3, 15 to 17. Luke 3, 15 to 17. And as the people were in expectation, all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he was the Christ or not. John answered, saying unto them, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy unto loose. He's much more powerful and greater than me. He is so mighty and great, I'm not worthy to stoop down and unloose his sandals, which was the function of servants. He's saying, I'm not good enough to be a slave because it was servants, house servants, slaves that will loosen the sandals of their masters. He goes, man, he is so great and mighty. I'm not even good enough to be a slave. That's how mighty and great he is. And he's so great. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Whose, whose fan is in his hand and he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner. But the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. So notice how great this one is. He says, look, the one who comes after me, he is the Lord I'm sent to prepare for. He is so great and mighty, mighty, I'm not good enough to be a slave to untie his sandals. And he has the power 
to immerse people either in the Holy Spirit or immerse people in fire, meaning either the Lord will save you and pour out the Spirit upon you or condemn you and immerse you in the fire of judgment. Everyone with me there? Who is this that John is talking about? Luke, who wrote Luke? Luke, who wrote Luke? Luke also wrote Acts. Acts 19, verse 4. Acts 19, verse 4. Watch here. Acts 19, verse 4. Watch here. Then said Paul, John very verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which uh, should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. End of story. Zacharias, filled with the Holy Spirit, knows that his son John is the forerunner of Jehovah God. And who is Jehovah God? Jesus Christ our Lord. That Jehovah God who becomes Jesus Christ, Jesus is the human enfleshment of Jehovah God comes to save Israel from their sins. Zechariah knows that. Zechariah's wife, Elizabeth, knows that. John knows that. They all know he is the one who is the God of Israel, who comes to become flesh, who becomes flesh in order to save us from our sins. They all knew that. Everyone got it? Is it making sense? No, the Holy Spirit is not the God of Jesus. Glory be to the trying God. Why is he not the God of Jesus? Because Jesus did not come to slave for the Holy Spirit or to fulfill the will of the Holy Spirit. He came to be a servant of the Father to fulfill his will. And the Holy Spirit, his eternal companion, came to work with him in fulfilling the Father's will. So to answer your question real quickly, the Holy Spirit never became Jesus' God. Because Jesus never became flesh to be the slave of the Spirit but the servant of the Father to carry out the Father's will. And the Holy Spirit came to work in union with him, work together with Jesus to bring about the perfect will of the Father. Did I answer your question? Glory to the triune God? Because I have an article on this too. Did I answer your question? And remind me for the articles before I close the session. Now, to really hammer out this point for St. Dennis, hammer out this point for St. Dennis, Let's go on to read what Luke also says about Jesus' work as Savior. Are you ready? Jesus' work as Savior. Okay. We read Christ the Lord is the Savior, Luke 2.11. All right. How does he save? Go to Luke 24. Let's read 44 to 47. Luke 24, verses 44 to 47. Exactly, indicator veritatas. Guys, do have me give you the articles to these questions because I've written articles on these questions. I've actually written articles. Luke 24, 44 to 47. And they, and he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, is Jesus speaking, and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me, you did and the... Uh, then open he their understanding that they might understand Scripture. He opened their minds by the Spirit to understand what was written about him. So that's what you pray. Holy Spirit of the Lord Jesus, open my mind so I can understand your word and live it out for the glory of Christ. Why do you think I keep telling you, seek the face of the Spirit, beg him to illuminate you? Because here you saw Jesus open their minds to understand and see clearly. Oh, wow. You need the Spirit to open your minds to understand and believe what you understand and live it. Well, now let's continue. Then open he their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures, 46 to 47. 46 to 47. And said unto them, Jesus speaking, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ. It was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. St. Dennis, what more proof do you need that Luke 1, 6 is not teaching Zechariah and Elizabeth were saved and perfect and blameless apart from Jesus, but they were saved and perfect and blameless because of Jesus, because the sacrificial system 
provided a temporary covering for their sins and imperfections. So that when they repent, God could for forgive them and reckon them as blameless because Jesus would come to do what the sacrificial system could not do, not just cover sin, but remove it completely. Yes, Jeremiah, this is off the top of my head. Guys, glorify the triune God, glorify the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Thank the Father, Son, Holy Spirit for this gift because someone is telling me, I'm doing the top of my head, not to boast, may the Lord crucify my flesh, may the Holy Spirit be glorified and fill me to glorify Jesus. Everything is from the top of my head. See, Frank Hoshab was laughing because you know why he's laughing? Frank used to come to my Bible study for years and he can testify. Did I use notes in any of the subjects? All right. So give him the glory. Frank Koshova, see, never. This is just the gift the Spirit gave me. It is humbling and it's shocking that the Spirit gave me this ability to recall, may he perfect it in me, and may I never fail the Spirit or shame the Spirit, but continue to glorify Christ. Because in all honesty, Sometimes if I think about it, it even freaks me out. How am I doing this? I'm not. He is. He gets the glory as he glorifies Jesus Christ. Okay, now, still, Aturaya, thank you. Aturaya, Ashurai. Let me give you a few more references, saints, so I can go into other questions. A few more references so I can go into other questions, okay? Let's go to Acts. Let's go to Acts. I was going to go chapter 2, verse 38, but you know what? No, let's go to Acts 10. Peter preaching, Peter preaching, filled with the Holy Spirit preaching, Acts chapter 10, verses 42 to 43. What does Peter, filled with the Spirit, say to Cornelius? How are people saved? See, Andrew Martin, who claims to be an atheist, but in his heart he loves Jesus and knows Jesus is alive, says Sam's ability is literally a sign of God, in my opinion. <laughs> he goes, yes, that does make my atheism incoherent until you realize it's a lack of theism. All right. You're, don't worry, you're on your way, brother. You're going to be in love with Jesus sooner than later, and you're going to be with us in heaven in Jesus' name. Acts 10, 42 to 43. St. Dennis, follow with me. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and dead, the living and the dead. Now watch what Peter says about the Old Testament prophets. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, Whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. So St. Dennis, what more proof do you need that even the Old Testament prophets prophesy by revelation of the Holy Spirit? It is Christ and belief in him and belief in his name that brings about the forgiveness of our sins. Because that's what Peter preached. Acts 13, 22 to 23. Acts 13, 22 to 23. Acts 13, 22. And this is the final one, St. Dennis. Final one for you. And when he had removed him, Peter, I'm sorry, Paul preaching. Please, Spirit, save me from error. Paul preaching. Paul preaching. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king. Ah, shit! Okay, sorry for the noise. That was Satan roaring like a lion, but his mouth has been crushed by the feet of Jesus. Amen. Muzzle him, Lord Jesus, for your glory and give us the victory. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony, said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fill, fulfill all my will. Now notice 23. And of this man's seed, David's seed, hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. Acts 13, 38 to 39. Acts 13, 38 to 39. I hope I thoroughly answered your question. Acts 13, 38 to 39. Yep, that was Muhammad writing to the Buddha. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Eric, who cares about philosophical arguments about the Trinity? 
Muslims can make philosophical arguments about Tawheed and it's still false. Better question is, can, are you experienced to debate the Trinity on the basis of Scripture, the biblical basis for the Trinity? That's the better question. Right? But anyway, I hope that answered your question. What was the other questions? There were two other questions that was asked of me. One was asked about Acts 21, 26, and the other was about John 10. Yes, James, he did. Father, Son, Holy Spirit know the human plight by observation, right? They see what's taking place in time and space. But Jesus, when he became man, experienced it firsthand, James. And that's even stated in Hebrews 2, verses 9 to 18. It says part of the reasons why he became flesh and blood, so he can sympathize with us. No firsthand human weakness and frailty, so he can sympathize with us. Okay? So what was the question? I'm deferring the question on transubstantiation. Man, I hate some of these words. Some of these words kill my lisp. I don't know if you are very observant. I have a lisp. Some questions make my lisp more pronounced. Okay? Lord willing... I will answer the question on transubstantiation near the end. Just be patient, dude, because we got different traditions here that believe in what's called the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, which is, again, if you're going to be honest, history, it is the position held by the church for centuries, even though I'm aware, because I parroted their arguments, that you can quote certain fathers that seem to suggest it's symbolic, not literal, but then if you read, like, for example, Tertullian, his statements can go either way. That it's not simply symbolic, but that the signs point to a reality. But I'll get to that. Just be patient. Because someone had asked me about Acts 21, 26. If he's not here, folks, you can ask your questions in the comment section or on Skype or call me. Anyone wants to call me? Skype me or what? Oh, yeah, Acts 21, 26. Here you go. Jesus Christ is Lord. The reason why I want to answer this question, you know, the reason why I want to answer this question is because it's relevant to understanding the relationship between Jews and Gentiles who believe in Christ. James Bancroft, you just repeated this more than once. You said, if the Puritans are right and the theater is sinful, would we then for going to the theater without repentance given that we didn't know it was sinful? James Bancroft, why are you quoting the Puritans for me when the Puritans are not authority for me Great men of God, but can be mistaken, just like I can be mistaken. Can you quote scripture? Hold on, Jesus Christ is Lord. I'll get to your question, I promise. Who's calling? Who is this? Who is this? Oh, sorry, Sam. Um, Ooh, this is Zachary, Zach. Which Zach? Here, uh, Zachary Adams, I just typed it in. Hey, you're question. scaring me, sorry, brother. Go ahead. Dark. What's your question? You're in the dark, man. You're scaring me, bro. I'm sorry. <laughs> Okay, what is it, my brother? Ask me. Uh, my question is about the book of Hebrews. I, well, I, somebody had told me that like they thought that the author was Paul, yes. and then now there's a consensus that they don't know who it is. Yeah. So modern consensus, right? Canon. Modern okay. consensus, right? Modern consensus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Historically, let me answer the question. So why is it in the canon? Excellent question. If you look at it historically. There was some debates over its canonicity because they didn't know who the author was. But mm -hmm. my brother, understand, that's an argument for the integrity of the church. Why do I say that? Hebrews is one of the most powerful apologetic in defense of the Trinity and the essential deity of Christ. Because in Hebrews 1, why are these people doing this thing? Man? Oh, good. Hebrews 1, in Hebrews 1, Jesus is identified as the unchangeable, immutable creator and sustainer of all creation, Jehovah God, in mm -hmm. the flesh. Hebrews 1, 10 to 12. The very fact, the very fact that some question its canonicity tells you the church wasn't simply blindly including books in the canon that agreed with its theology. Because mm -hmm. if anything, if that was the prerequisite, well, you'd have to obviously agree, but if that was the only reason, they would have included it. To them, it had to be more than that. It had to be what they called <clears throat> the principle of apostolicity, meaning. It had to have been composed during the time of the apostles and their companions when inspiration was taking place. So mm -hmm. the very fact some question it tells you their integrity. So why did it end up in the canon? Because 
enough people believe it was written by Paul. It was written by Paul. And most likely he used what they call an amanuensis, a secretary. And this has been the belief of the church up until modern times, until the rise of post-enlightenment critical biblical scholarship. Okay, so when you say there's a consensus now, you're talking about the consensus of 21st century scholars due to the influence of liberal critical scholarship because the early church already, already dealt with these issues. Well, it's not named. How can it be Paul? Well, he used the scribe. In fact, there's a theory that says the Greek of Hebrews is so close to the Greek of Luke and Acts that most likely Paul used Luke as his scribe, secretary, to pen down the revelation. And once you go with that route, there is no good objection against Pauline authorship. Uh -huh, uh -huh. What good objection uh -huh. do you have? Paul used Luke. You can't uh -huh. disprove that. So I tend to agree with the voice of the early church, which was the tradition for centuries, that Paul wrote it using a scribe, an amanuensis. And there are reasons why, <clears throat> good reasons why to believe it's Paul. Because even those who don't believe it's Paul, they believe it's Pauline in its theology. In other words, you mm -hmm. see heavy emphasis of Pauline thought or Pauline thought throughout the letter. And there's even a reference to Timothy, who's going to be released from prison. Hebrews 13, 23. Let's quote that. Hebrews 13, 23. See, Ariel? Great minds think alike, bro. Ariel, I was saying it, and you just wrote it. See? You think like me, you must be great. Anyway, Hebrews 13, 23. Mm -hmm. Let me read it for them. Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty. He's been free. Of whom, if he comes shortly, I will see you. So be careful of just accepting anything and everything that comes from the pens or the lips of modern scholars, even evangelical scholars. Unfortunately, even evangelical scholarship has been influenced by liberal scholarship. And I'm not saying everything in liberal you know, scholarship is bad because that's a genetic fallacy. Um, no, no. But a lot of the arguments of liberal scholarship, if push comes to shove, are based on theories and assumptions, not historical fact. And for some reason, evangelical scholars want to embrace these views, even though they're not based on facts, but assumptions and theories, almost because they want the esteem of liberal academia. And you'll find that even when it comes to textual issues like Mark 16, verses 9 to 20, or John 7, 53 to 8, 11. But my, my response would be, number one, the church already had an issue about why it's anonymous. And some people cast a doubt on its canonicity. But number two, enough people believe that there was strong tradition connecting it with Paul and that Paul may have used a scribe, and so they included in the canon. Number three, the very fact that it was questioned shows the integrity of the church. Why? Because Hebrews is one of the most powerful apologetic books, one of the most beautifully in-depth and profound books expounding on the Old Testament sacrificial system, Jesus' superiority, and Jesus being Jehovah in the flesh, the Son of the Father, companion of the Spirit. So if anything, you wouldn't expect to be any questions because the theology is so solid, but still that tells you it wasn't sufficient to show that it's theologically sound. It must have been composed during the era in which the apostles were there and their companions with them receiving inspiration to give us not just theological treatises, but inspired canonical writings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That would be my Thank response, you. to be honest. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Thank mm -hmm. you, Sam. So, brother, like I said, don't just follow modern scholarship. Weigh the arguments mm -hmm. from all sides and look into church history. Let me encourage you. Go back mm -hmm. and look into church history. These spiritual forebears of ours were not dummies. They were brilliant, sophisticated, philosophically trained men already wrestled with these issues, and they were holy men who loved Jesus and were, were willing to die as martyrs, and many of them did. To simply ignore them is a travesty. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So if that answered your question, you have another one? Thank you. No, I just want to say that I just, I'm just i just very appreciative of all the stuff that you've done. I've been listening to you for years, and it really mm -hmm. changed the way I think. I am an ex-Muslim, and it just really, wow! you know. Ex-Muslim, guys, another man who found Jesus.
Jesus shine his face on you and seal you for his glory forever. May you never return to Islam or unbelief in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Sam. Man, you made my day. I'm gonna, you. I'll go back to because you made my day, I'm going to go order me some pizza. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank God you. Bless. Thank you, Sam. I'll you. go back to this stream. Thank you. Bye. Good questions, you guys, man. Good questions. Hey, Ariel, why do you think like me, bro? Does that mean you're a genius because you think like me or I'm the genius because I think like you? Huh? All right? Okay, anyway. You're not no, you're not kidding. I'm not kidding, you little sinner, Frank Lachon. If you weren't cheap, you can order me pizza from Illinois. Just call the pizzeria here where I'm at, pay it on your card and send it to me, you little cheapo. The le least you can do, Frank. Okay. Any other questions? Should I take Acts 2126 or does someone else still want to call me before I take Acts 2126? Yeah, I can't explain John 20. Yes, he did, Tony. Man, you guys are excellent. Uh, there's three excellent questions. Okay, let me go to Acts 2126. Okay, Tony, before I end the session, and Horizon Val, before I end the session, please remind me to answer Luke 7, 1823, John 20, 22, 23. I don't want to end the session without answering those questions, God willing. But let me answer Acts 2126. Yeah. Acts one because today's my junk day. So anyway, Acts twenty one twenty six. Okay, uh, uh, everyone ready for Acts twenty one twenty six? State the objection, brother, so I can address it. State the objection, brother, so I can address it. So I can address it. Now you may not like guys. Before I even answer, it, I'm going to give you my understanding, but I'm not infallible. I'm not inspired. If you disagree with me, go study the issue. See where you think I'm wrong. Go with that. Run with that if you have a better answer. But do pray for me. God keeps me teachable. So if I'm wrong, he shows me and I correct myself for the glory of Christ. I'm just giving you how I see it after all these years of intense study. So, brother, Jesus Christ is Lord. Repeat your question so they can understand what you're asking so I can address it. Okay, we're just waiting for the answer. Excellent questions today. Man, you guys are on fire. I wanted to go back and touch on Numbers 31, but let's see if I have time. If Jesus Christ is Lord is here. Did he leave? Did he abandon me? Is he upset? Is he hurt? If you're hurt, then I'm going to have more pizza. All right, here's his question. Did Jesus' sacrifice replace the whole sacrificial system? Because a Muslim raised the objection in Acts 21, 26, Paul made an offering sacrifice for the hour. Okay, folks, you're going to have a dilemma here. In Acts 24, 17, Paul says that one of the reasons why he came to Jerusalem one of the reasons why he came to Jerusalem was to offer sacrifices in the temple. Let's go to Acts 24, 17. He mentioned Acts 21, 26, but I'm going to go to Acts 24, 17. Because Paul is under trial and he's giving a response. Why he was falsely accused and arrested under false charges. Acts 24, 17. Okay. Now, after many years, Paul speaking, guys. Pay attention here. Focus so you can learn. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms to my nation and offerings. So you guys know what the word offerings means. Now, shut up, Muhammad. Burak ain't going to help you, sucker. Hold on. That's what happens when you're close to the balcony, right? And that's what happens, right? All right, Acts. Let me get you the link so you can see what the word for offerings happens to be. Notice, Paul, why did you come? To Jerusalem. Why did you come to Jerusalem, Paul? Why? Go oh, there. Acts 24, 17. Thank God for modern technology. Go read the word for offerings. <laughs> These words. Pros for us. Pros for us. Hey, pros for us, buddy. You're a pro for us, baby. Pros for us. Anyway. When you go see what the word is, prosphora, here's the lexicon source. It means an offering, sacrifice. Offering, sacrifice. So why did Paul come to Jerusalem? Because the temple is still standing, and he's coming to offer sacrifices. Acts 21, 26. Thank you, Cynthia. God, God bless you guys. Thank you, guys, for your contribution. Thank you for your support, you super chatters. I have to collect it sooner than later, man. God bless you guys. All right. Anyway, Acts 21, 26. Acts 21, 26. 
I may end it with Numbers 31, 17, 18 again. Okay. Then Paul took the men. There were four men that had taken a Nazarite vow. And the next day, purifying himself with them, entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. Four men had taken a Nazarite vow in Jerusalem. Paul is in Jerusalem. Four Jewish believers in Jesus. Pay attention. Four Jewish believers in Jesus had taken a Nazarite vow according to number six. At the completion of the vow, they're going to shave their heads because part of the vow is you can't touch your hair with a razor and offer the sacrifices prescribed in number six, verse 14, for the completion of a Nazarite vow. Let's see what number six, 14 says those sacrifices have to be. What are those sacrifices? Watch here. Number 614. Watch here. I got a great bunch of mods, honestly. I thank Jesus for every one of them. I love every one of them. Ariel, Alan, Protestant, First and Last, Magdalene, Anna Grung. Helps all of you. I love all you guys, man. You guys are great. Anyway, number 614. Let's read. And he shall, this is God saying, when he finishes the Nazarite vow, when he finishes the Nazarite vow, it says, He shall offer his offering unto the Lord, one he lamb of the first year without blemish for a burnt offering, one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish for a sin offering, one ram without blemish for peace offerings. That's what Paul just did. In Acts 21, 26, we know from the context it's a Nazarite vow, so they don't touch their hair with a razor. They complete the vow, shave their head, and offer these sacrifices. So here's the question. And by the way, if you doubt that offering is offered means a sacrifice, there you go. So I know how you guys are. Bunch of skeptics. No matter what I say, it's never good enough because I'm not good looking because I'm not blonde like Hulk Hogan, Halal Hogan. And so you're already racist against me. There you go. Acts 21, 26. Just ask Hafsa. Pacha. Acts 21, 26. Go look for the word there. Here it is. You don't even need to read Greek. It says, each one of them, a sacrifice, prosphora, was offered. There's that word again, prosphora. You saw what it means. So now here's the question, folks. Shut up, Momo. Burak ain't getting you anywhere, sucker. All right, anyway. Let's get back to the issue. Here is... Here's the question. Paul and these Jewish believers in Jesus are in Jerusalem about to go to the temple and offer animal sacrifices years after Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension. Why are they continuing to offer sacrifices when they know it is the one sacrifice of Christ that takes away sin and those animal sacrifices only covered sin, couldn't take it away. And now they've been fulfilled, completed, consummated in Christ's sacrifice. So they're done away with. So why are they doing it? You understand the question? I will do a Halal Hogan impersonation before I'm done. You understand the question? Why are they doing it? But wait, it's not just Paul. Do you know Peter and John were observing the sacrifices? Let's go to Acts 3, verse 1. Acts 3, verse 1. Boy, do I love this book. Honestly, guys, if you understand the Bible and the Holy Spirit illuminates you, you can't help but fall in love with this book. It is so magnificent and supernatural. It testifies that the God of this book is infinitely amazing. Okay, Acts 3, 1. Watch here. Acts 3, verse 1. Here. Now, Peter... And John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Guys, write this down. We're not going to look at it. Write down Numbers 28, verses 3 to 8. Numbers 28, verses 3 to 8. God had ordained and prescribed that the priest would offer morning and evening sacrifices. The morning sacrifice at the time of Christ took place at 9 in the morning. The evening sacrifice, it just told you right there, 
Ninth hour, 3 o'clock p.m. When they would offer the morning and evening sacrifices, the Jews would go to the temple to pray as the priests were sacrificing. So now here's a question. Why did Peter and John go up to the temple at 3 p.m. to observe the evening sacrifice and prayer when they knew full well Jesus, the Lamb of God, had died, completed, perfected, consummated, all sacrifices. So these sacrifices are now ineffectual. They're not efficacious, and now they're made obsolete. Why? Now, you ready for the answer? Why would they continue to observe them? You ready for the answer? Everyone ready? I'm just doing it. You ready? Okay. The answer is very simple. Now they go to the temple and partake of these festivities with the knowledge these sacrifices don't take away sin. They point to Jesus who does. So they don't observe them because they believe they atone. They continue to observe them because they become the continual reminder of what Jesus has done, similar to the Eucharist. Similar to the Eucharist, meaning when you take the Eucharist, it is reminding you. And by the way, this has nothing to do with whether you believe it's the little body, blood of Christ. Still, it's reminding you Jesus died for your sins, rose again, and you continue to honor what he has done until he returns. So they did it with that attitude. The attitude is, I can now go to the temple. Now go to the temple and now observe these sacrifices with the revelation. They do not take away sin, but they point it to the one who does and who already came and took away my sin. So they become the reminder of what my Lord has done for me. Zella, you're hoping I become Catholic. I've been reading Orthodox. I've been praying I become Orthodox. And I thank you guys. That means you love me. Thank you, honestly. That blesses my heart. Yeah, we're up at 200. I want 250. Did that answer your question? Jesus Christ is the Lord? Yeah, I know, Frank. You would like that, right? But I'm going to tell you something, Frank. I know you're a hater. I know you're upset. I introduced you to Calvinism, and then I abandoned shape, ship. Because there used to be a five-point Calvinist, and Calvinist, now you're a 20-point Calvinist, loser. But anyway, here's what I am. I am a Roman Orthodox member of the Church of the East who's always prot protesting. Okay? Now, let me answer the question about transubstantiation. I have to be honest and say the view, the majority view, the, the view found in the writings of the fathers and the view that became the dominant view among all the traditions is that the bread and wine becomes the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. There's no denying it. This is historical. It's ancient and early. I know that there have been some, and I've actually quoted them, that would quote Tertullian, who believed that they were symbols. But in reality, if you look at Tertullian after re-looking at it, it's not necessarily the case that Tertullian thought it was symbolic, but he did teach there were symbols that pointed to the reality so that he held to the view it is the body and blood of Christ and that the bread of the one are symbols of that reality. So it's not simply symbolic. It is the body and blood of Christ, and these are the symbols of the body and blood of Christ, and it is the body and blood of Christ. Anyway, with that said, I have to be honest to, to how God has worked in history. My tradition has been... Let me explain. Let me answer for my tradition because I'm not trying to be a crowd pleaser. God forbid. God forbid I tickle ears and try to be a crowd pleaser because I don't want to offend you. I love you and I don't want to offend you unnecessarily, but let me tell you what my tradition is. I was raised, even though my parents, even though my parents are from the Church of the East, and the Church of the East, the Coptic tradition, the Roman Catholic tradition, the Orthodox tradition, all of them believe that when the priest prays, by the power of the Spirit. That bread and wine is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. I was not raised in the Church of the East. I was raised among independent fundamental Baptists. And so they drilled in my mind that the bread and the wine are symbolic of the body and blood of Christ. 
And that's what has been instilled in me. That's what I believe. And I'll be honest with you guys. I'm very honest. I even wrote an article on my blog on my reasons why I don't accept that it's literally the body, blood of Christ. I'm having a hard time unseeing that. I'm just being honest. So here's your prayer for me. If it is the body and blood and soul, divinity of Christ, ask the Holy Spirit to set me free. Because once something is instilled in you, it is very hard to unlearn it and no longer believe it. I'm just being honest. I have, I'm have. i just being as honest as I can. It was so instilled in me. It's a symbol of the body and blood of Christ. A symbol of the body and blood of Christ. That when I think it's the body and blood of Christ, it doesn't register. It's like I go blank. I'm hitting the brick. I'm being honest. Right? So here's how you pray for me. If I am wrong, ask the Holy Spirit in his mercy to set me free and illuminate me to accept the truth from the Holy Spirit. You get what I'm saying, Brian? That's what I'm saying, Brian. If it's not merely a symbol, Brian, may the Holy Spirit show you and me where we're wrong. Now, with that said, with that said, though that's my position, it's been instilled in me. It's been instilled in me. You cannot, you cannot. Those of you who believe it's symbolic, and I'm talking to you guys, talking to those who believe the symbolic view, or even the spiritual view, that it's not just a symbol, but Christ is, in some sense, spiritually present. And by the way, <laughs> side note, this is not just the belief of Catholics or Orthodox. Martin Luther and Lutherans and Episcopalians believe in that too. You have Protestants who believe it. Lutherans, now correct me if I'm wrong, Lutherans, Martin Luther himself, and Episcopalians believe that the bread and wine are, do become the body, blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. Yep, exactly, Alan Rubble. And didn't Martin Luther and Zwingli go at it? Didn't they go at it? Yeah, I've read that, Frank. I've dealt with that passage, brother. I got a session on it. Brother, been there, done that. Okay, now, coming back to the issue. For those of you who believe it's symbolic, you cannot look down on and condemn those who believe that it becomes the body and blood, soul of Christ, divinity of Christ. You know why you can't? Because that's the ancient tradition. That's the predominant tradition. That's the tradition that was predominant in the early centuries of the church. And that was also the dominant position even up until the time of the Reformation so that even Martin Luther believed it. See, even Ariel Gonzalez said, Martin Luther thought Catholics are more Christians than Zwinglians who thought it was symbolic. You understand what I'm saying to you saints here? Those of us who believe symbolic, if we were at the time of Athanasius, we would be condemned as the heretics. Do you know that? We would be condemned as the heretics. You with me there? So that's why you believe in it. Lord bless you. In fact, can I tell you what one of my heart's desires is? What's my heart's desires? Can I tell you honestly? Man, people are going to attack me now. They're going to say, man, dude, you are dangerous, bro. What happened to you? Like Frank already. Frank was going to order me pizza. He goes, no, I'm canceling, bro. You're too ecumenical for me. No, I want to be honest to the Spirit. Honestly, honestly, I beg the Holy Spirit to make me pure and holy, to save me from my flesh and failures because I'm a failure. Keep me pure, Holy Spirit. And I'll be honest with you. Maybe one way that would help me. Honestly, I'm just saying it. I'm content to be single until Jesus takes me home. But I think... If there was a godly woman who loved the Lord, that would help me in some of my struggles, my fleshly desire. But God's will be done. And my desire is, Holy Spirit, bring me into all truth, whatever truth is. Give me the grace to accept it, even if it's going to cost me people following me and attacking me. I want to be faithful to you, and I want to be in love with you. I don't just want to believe for the sake of agreeing with the crowds. Please, Holy Spirit. You know what I ache for, guys? Do you know what I ache for? I'm gonna, I'll be honest. I'm going to share a story with you. It probably is going to make me cry again. Okay. I ache to go to the Assyrian church, the church of my parents, 
the church of my parents, every Sunday, I'm about to cry right now. I really am about to cry, honestly. The church of my parents, and that Sunday, walk the line and take from the hand of the priest or the deacons the bread and the cup with my Assyrian brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay? But the reason why I can't is because they insist. They insist. You must, you must believe it becomes the body, blood of Christ. Otherwise, don't take it. And I'm telling you, right now, that doesn't register. I'm not able to see it. I'm not. So if I'm right, may the Lord show me I'm right. If I'm wrong, may he set me free. And because of that, I will not dishonor the church of my parents, the Syrian Church of the East, and I won't take it so I don't dishonor them. But if a priest tells me, look, even if you believe it's symbolic, come and take it, I promise you I'll be the first one Sunday there. I promise you I'll be the first one Sunday to take it. Let me share another story with you guys, if you don't mind, and I'll take some more questions. Okay, more questions. I hope you guys are okay. I visited an Orthodox church, and I forget the saint's name. Saint, I don't want to mispronounce his name because I'm not trying to be disrespectful. Haralambos, Saint Haralambos. Okay, it was his feast day. Okay, so I went. It was Greek festival, and I was alone. Hambur, Hambur I don't know what it is. I was alone. I was alone. Yeah, Haralambos. Thank you, Haralambos. I was alone, and I was lonely. It was a Sunday. I was lonely, missing my kids. So I said, Lord, where should I go? And it said Greek festival. I go, maybe I'll go there and run into people. I ran there. It wasn't well attended. But then they had a service. And this was an English-speaking Greek Orthodox church for English speakers. So I went in there, and they said, come in the morning for morning vespers, is it? Vespers, or that was evening vespers. Anyway, because for I went there in the morning. When they got up to take the bread, guys, in my heart, true story, Lord knows I'm not lying. I was there in my heart. So I'm, I'm about to cry, and I want to cry, so I don't think I'm putting on a show here. I said, Lord, how I ache, how I ache to go and take that bread and cup, Lord. I ache for you. I just so want to eat that bread and drink from that cup. And the Lord heard me. You know how he heard me? You know how he heard me? I was saying that to my heart. An older lady, older lady came. She gave me a piece of the bread. When she gave it to me, I was astonished. I didn't eat it there because I don't want to be disrespectful. I went to my car and I said, I'm about to cry. <clears throat> <clears throat> I took that bread and I said to the Lord this is your gift to me <clears throat> this is your gift to me thank you Lord thank you this is your gift to me <clears throat> and I ate it <clears throat> yeah so that's what happened that's what he did for me so, you know, that's where I'm at. That's where I'm at, guys. How I wish the Lord would just save me from my flesh and my imperfections so I can shine more brighter with his glory. So anyway, that's what happened. That's where I'm at. There were two questions I was asked, unless someone wants to call. One about Luke 7, 18, Luke 7, 18 and 23. And that happened just a couple of months ago, guys. by the way. Guys, I'm not lying. The Lord is my witness. That's a true story. True story. Yeah. Tony... Luke 7, 18 to 23, let's address that. Yeah, yeah, it was a couple months ago, Ariel. Uh, Ariel. If you go look, the celebration of St. Haralambos wasn't too long ago, several months ago. Haralambos. So this is recent, man. This is recent. Right? That's my conviction. I know there are my Protestant brothers and sisters in Christ who think maybe I've gone on the deep end. I even had uh, James White, you know, brother in Christ. Uh, in one of his uh, DL shows was it long, not too long ago. Hey, Sam is like sounding Catholic, like he's going to cross the Tiber. Okay. Anyway, now with that said, with that said, let me deal with Luke 7, 18 and 20. Yeah, he did, Frank. 
Frank, he did. What do you want me to do? Right? Hey, he can, he can say, listen, man. I don't want to offend anyone. I don't want to offend James White. I don't want to offend my brother, Anthony Rogers, Edward Ducklore. I don't want to offend you guys. But at the same time, I don't want to be a crowd pleaser. I don't want to tickle your ears. I don't want to tickle your ears. I want to be as loving as possible and serve you to the best of my ability, but true to my convictions for the glory of Jesus Christ. And you know, people are going to hear this and they're going to attack me, right? They're going to attack me. They're going to take this. And they say, look, look, you see, ecumenical, man. He's about to cross the Tiber or he's going to go to Mount Athos, one of the two. Yeah, that started, that sent shockwaves. Francis Chan saying that for 1,500 years, there was one church and they all believed in Eucharist. That sent shockwaves among others. They attacked Francis Chan, folks. One church, 1,500 years, and they all believed in the Eucharist. And people went livid. What, Francis Chan? Didn't you graduate from John MacArthur's, what was the seminary or whatever? You know that's not true. Well, folks, in all honesty, this was the dominant position. And it became the, the position held by all the major churches, even those in schism. It's just a fact, man. It's just a fact. But anyway, who am I to speak? Now, Luke 7, 18 to 23. Now, before we go to Luke 7, 18, 23, I got to get something to drink because for some reason the air condition is not working and it's hot. And Frank's comments is only agitating me even more. And the more he comments, the angrier I get and I sweat more. Frank, you better send me that pizza. So, guys, just wait. I'm going to get me some water. And as I get me some water, maybe that's why because I closed the door. Okay. See, wow, the air condition is working out here but not in here. Frank, this is what you do. You get my blood boiling, Frank. Send me that pizza, sucker. All right, let me just get, let me get me some water, and I'll sing some songs to entertain you. We were sailing off. Oh, 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 Whistle while you work. Rudolph the red nosed reindeer had a very shiny nose. And if you ever saw him. All right, okay, ready? Whistle while you work. All right, hold on, let me do this. Whistle while you work. We were singing along. Moonlight Bay. All right. Now, Luke 7, 18 to 23. Luke 7, 18 to 23. Ready? All right. What's the objection? Did John, John really doubt Jesus Christ? Did John really doubt Jesus Christ? How could he? Okay. You guys ready for the answer? Because in Luke 7, 18 to 23... John the Baptist was in prison. He heard about Jesus' miracles. So he sent two of his disciples to Jesus saying, are you the one or should we expect another to come? So what's the question? Did John doubt Jesus? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Now, are you ready for me to unpack this? Come on, King Hills. Don't repeat a stupid Muslim argument, man. If you're asking me sincerely, I'll answer that. But if you're asking me to ask, I'm going to avoid you and ignore you. Okay. Let me tell you what the Bible says. Folks, number one, the Bible is an inspired record of actual historical events and actual conversations that took place among people without the Bible necessarily affirming all that it reports. Uh, let me give you an example of what I mean. A newspaper man or the television reports that in the riots, some guy got beaten to a bloody pulp and someone got raped. Does that mean because they report it, they endorse that act? Are they endorsing that act because they report it? No, of course not. But they're accurately reporting what took place. So in the Bible, the Bible will often accurately record accurately record the things that people have done without necessarily having God's approval. Second thing about the Bible, 
The Bible doesn't sugarcoat and cover up the warts, the imperfections of the main characters of the narratives. In other words, if Abraham committed a sin, the Bible will say it. Because the Bible is not about glorifying man, making man more than he is. The Bible is an honest record of the imperfection, the weakness, the fallibility and sinfulness of men, even the best and most holy servants of God who are capable of committing the most heinous and horrendous sins. Everyone with me? Before I move on? Exactly. Unlike the Quran, Ms. V. Ms. V, whoever you are, I want to kiss your head. I'm suspecting you're daughter of Christ because you're very knowledgeable about the Arabic. Lord bless you and shine his face on you. But anyway, are you with me there? So what do I mean? The Bible will tell you that though Abraham was a friend of God, he still was weak and a sinner. I'll prove it to you. What do you say about Abraham who makes a deal with Sarah? Makes a deal with Sarah. Genesis 20 verse 13. Let's read it. Genesis 20, verse 13. Watch here. Genesis 20, verse 13. <clears throat> and it came to pass, this is Abraham speaking. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said unto her, this is the kindness which thou shalt show unto me. He's talking to Sarah. At every place, whither we shall go, say of me, he is my brother. Now, folks, notice the cowardice of Abraham, who is the friend of God. He says, Sarah, you're so stunningly beautiful that people will kill me to have you. If I have found favor in your sight, don't tell them you're my wife. Tell them that I'm your brother, which means that Sarah will then be taken away and be defiled by another man. Now, notice who showed more faith. Sarah agreed. She goes, okay, out of my love for you, to spare your life, I'll say I'm your sister. And on two occasions, Genesis 12 and Genesis 20. Don't take my word for it. Genesis 12, Genesis 20. On two occasions, two occasions, two men, Pharaoh of Egypt and Abimelech, the king of Gerar, took her to their bed to defile her, and God intervened and stopped them. Notice God had to do a miracle to protect her from being defiled because Abraham did not have the courage or the trust in God to protect her. Now, women, how many of you would honor and respect a husband like that? Hey, uh, sister, you want fine looking babe, mama, but we're about to go into Muslim territory and please tell them you're my sister because I don't want to die so they can have you. How would you feel about such a man? So who had more faith, Sarah or Abraham, that Sarah was willing to be defiled to save her husband? And yet Abraham loved his life more. He didn't care if another man defiled his wife. Isn't she amazing? It makes you love and respect Sarah more that she's willing to defile herself, be defiled to spare her husband's life, and it shows you how amazing God is. He comes to the defense of Sarah. No, 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 no. You don't touch that woman. You touch her, you're as good as dead. That woman is the wife of my servant. Stay away from her. Okay. Let me give you another example. Israel. Israel sees the plagues. Israel sees the Red Sea split. They enter the wilderness. They he see the cloud come down. This is Exodus chapter 19, Exodus chapter 20, all the way to chapter 24. You can read it. They see the cloud come down. They hear a voice audibly speak from the cloud. I'm your God. And from the voice, they're stricken with terror and say, Moses, we don't want to hear the voice. You talk to us. Moses answers the cloud, remains 40 days, and in full view of God whom they see is in the cloud. They don't see his form, but they see the cloud, and they know he's in it because they heard his voice. They built calves to worship them as gods in defiance of God who's right there. 
On top of that, they're constantly complaining, there's no water in the desert. You brought us here to die? Wasn't there enough graves in Egypt that you had to bring us out here to die? Defying God in his face in spite of all the miracles they saw. So why would it shock you? Why would it shock you that John the Baptist, though born of the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, heard the voice of God, who's still a human, who still has sins that he struggles with, who's still weak and succumbed to a moment of weakness and started doubting Christ, when you have Israel seeing God in a cloud and they deny him in his face, the apostles who see Jesus walk on water, feed multitudes, raise the dead, cast out demons, Peter, James, and John are in the mount, the cloud comes down, they hear the voice of the Father, Moses and Elijah, Christ transfigured, and they all abandoned him, took off, and denied him. Why would it shock you? So why would it shock you that John the Baptist, in a moment of weakness, he's in prison. And in that imprisonment, the flesh kicks in. And he starts feeding the flesh instead of walking in the spirit. And as he starts feeding those doubts, he becomes weaker spiritually and his sinfulness becomes stronger. And in that moment, he starts questioning Jesus. So why would that shock you? Some use that argument, Alan. I know that's among many of the church fathers that he was saying that for their benefit. Now, I don't have a problem with that, but Alan, you know, when you have a skeptic, they're going to laugh that off and say, nah, that's just your spin on it because you can't handle what the text says. So I'm going with that interpretation to say, okay, he did doubt. And Razzles, whatever he thought, he was in a moment of weakness, Razzle. But that should give you hope. Let me tell you why it should give you hope. If even the best of saints, even the best of saints who saw God visibly, heard God audibly, did miracles, can also succumb and fail, and God still show them mercy and compassion and pity and forgive them, there's hope for you and I. There's hope for you and I, right? Man, I have not seen the cloud visibly. I haven't heard the voice of God audibly. I didn't see Jesus walk on water. I didn't see the Red Sea split. If these people saw that and can still doubt, then you better believe God will have compassion, mercy, and pity on me. Is that making sense now? Amen. If someone can walk with God in human flesh or hear God in a cloud audibly or see the Red Sea split and still defy, deny, and doubt, you think God doesn't understand your weakness? You and I haven't seen the Lord physically. You and I haven't heard the Lord audibly. You and I haven't seen God descend in a cloud and tell us this is my son. You better believe he has compassion, mercy, and love, and pity for your situation. Because the Lord is going to say, even my friend Abraham didn't have enough trust in me to protect his wife. And I walked with him. And I spoke to him audibly and appeared to him visibly in human form. So I'm not surprised that you who haven't seen would also struggle with doubts. And another reason why he has compassion is because Jesus, Jesus became flesh, became man. And he understands the human condition. He understands. And you know what? Let me take a moment to preach here. And it's probably going to make me cry again. Okay? You know what's a beautiful thing about Jesus? You know what's a beautiful thing about Jesus, guys? I mean, everything's beautiful about him. But can I show you something? You know, you can never go before Jesus and say this. I've said this in the past. I'm going to repeat it again. Let me repeat it again. Okay, watch here. You can't say to Jesus and say, you don't know what it's like to lose a child. Pay attention, please. Holy Spirit, move them to listen. 
Move them, Holy Spirit, to listen. Because if you don't, there's nothing I can do. I yield to you, Holy Spirit. Pay attention to this. Because I've reflected and meditated on this. See, guys, it's not enough to read the word. Read with understanding and meditate. Take a scene in the Bible, play it in your mind. Imagine how it's like and put yourself there because it's real. Make it real to you. When you go before Jesus and you say, well, you don't know what it's like to lose a child. And if I don't, you know what he's going to say? Beloved, I hung on a cross, naked, beaten to a bloody pulp, whipped to the point of death, gasping for air, and my mother had to see her beloved die before her eyes. Don't tell me I don't know. You don't know what it's like to be betrayed and abandoned by your best friends. And he's going to look at you and smile. I don't. Every single apostle and disciple that ate with me, that sat next to me, that slept next to me, whom I loved and blessed and did miracles before them, on the night of my betrayal, they all abandoned me. And even one of them sold me for 30 pieces of silver. And Peter, who I gave the honor of seeing things the other apostles didn't see, denied me three times in the very court courtyard where I was being <clears throat> judged. Beloved, don't tell me I don't know what it's like to be abandoned by my friends and betrayed. And you can't say to Jesus, well, you don't know what it's like to have your own brothers mock you and hate you and despise you. Again, the Lord's going to look at you. I don't. Mark 3, 20 to 21. It says his own family thought he was out of his mind and came to take him home because they're embarrassed of him. John 7, verses 1 to 5. John 7, verse 1 to 5 says that his brothers wanted Jesus to show himself publicly because they didn't believe in him and were trying to get him arrested and killed. And so Jesus says, Beloved, my own family members were embarrassed by me, were ashamed of me, were ashamed of me, thought I was crazy and out of my mind and wanted to get rid of me by exposing me to public danger so I could be arrested if not killed. And you know what's sad? If you read John 19, none of those family members were at the cross. His mother was there and John was there, but none of his family members, those called his brothers. In other words, Jesus is going to say, Jesus is going to say, I know your condition better than you can imagine because I entered the world to experience your plight. I entered the world and I even chose a humble family that was too poor. They couldn't afford the regular sacrifice. If you read Luke 2, it says that they offered two turtle doves. If you go there, according to Leviticus 12, that was a sacrifice of a family that would be too poor to offer the regular sacrifice for purification. I chose to live in a poor household. I chose to be raised by a poor carpenter. I chose a carpenter to be my adoptive father. You know why that's significant? Because in Jewish culture, you would have to learn your father's trade. A good son would follow in the footsteps of his father. So guess who chooses to be his adoptive father? Joseph, a carpenter, which means that from the time Jesus was considered a man, he would learn the trade of Joseph and engage in hard physical construction and labor day in, day out, in all those conditions. Jesus never made it easy for himself. Never. You don't know what it's like to work and bust your back working in all these conditions and still not have much on the table. And Jesus will smile at you because I don't. 
Have you ever read the Gospels in my life? Do you know who was my adoptive father? Do you know what his trade was? Not only a carpenter, he would have been a stonemason lifting. I, the creator of heaven and earth, I own creation. I entered the world and I deliberately chose a carpenter to raise me. And I learned his trade. And day in, day out, I carried stones. Day in, day out, I carried wood. Day in, day out, I would sweat and feel the anguish of my back hurting, my neck hurting, my muscles from all that hard labor. And I did that until I was 30 years old. And I had to wait till I was 30 before I began my ministry. So what can you say to Jesus that he doesn't identify with? What experience can you bring to Jesus that he himself has not personally experienced while he was on earth? Can you tell me? This is what makes him so beautiful. You know what make, why he's so beautiful? He understands your pain. He understands the heartache of a parent bearing a child because he allowed his own blessed mother. Do you understand the sacrifice that she had to go through? So I'm about to cry here. The Lord knew. If I choose this woman to be my mother, I also choose her to experience something no parrot ever wants to experience, a child dying before them and before their eyes. But this is the way of, of, of salvation. So woman, I create you to be my mother. And yet, unfortunately, in choosing you to be my mother, I will have to allow you to experience the pain and the heartbreak of your son, <clears throat> the one who was in your womb for nine months, <clears throat> the one you gave birth to, <clears throat> the one that you fed, the one that you burped, the one that you bathed, hanging before you on a cross, beaten to a bloody pulp, whipped to the point of death, seeing your son with spikes in his hands and then breathe his last breath before your eyes. So don't tell me I don't know what you've been through. Yeah. Yeah, it makes you cry. I know. It makes even men cry. Right? It makes men cry to think about it. To see your child gasping for air. And then he says these words, Father, <clears throat> into your hands I commit my spirit. And he expires before your eyes expires before your eyes which parent wants to experience that which parent wants to experience that hold on let me close my brothers here so right <clears throat> no wonder they call him savior right no wonder he's such a beautiful god so the lord's going to say i know your situation more than you can understand. Now, let me give you a final one. I'll take a question or two, and then we're going to call it a night. Let me give you another example of the heart of Jesus. John 11, 33 to 35. John 11, 33 to 35. Watch here. Guys, this one, I pray you'll understand the depth of this. Watch this. <clears throat> John 11, 33, 35. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit, groaned. He was in anguish, in pain, groaned in the spirit, and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said, unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. The shortest verse in the English Bible. Jesus wept wept and again i pray the holy spirit move you to understand the implication of this jesus had just got done telling martha i'm going to raise your brother i'm going to resurrect him know who i am know who i am 
So he just told her that, and he's weeping. Do you know why he's weeping? He's not weeping for Lazarus. Jesus is God over death. It broke his heart to see all these people crying and heartbroken because of the loss of a loved one. He cried because of their pain. You understand what that means? You understand what that means, guys? Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And here is the human face of God. This is God Almighty in the flesh. And you see even God sheds a tear. Even God cries. You know what that means today, folks? You have a Savior in heaven that when he sees you crying, he cries with you. When he sees you sad, his heart breaks for you because he's connected to you. So when my Lord hears my daughters crying at night, where is Baba? Lord, I want Baba. The Lord cries with them. When the Lord sees me at night sitting there and saying, Sovereign Lord, Sovereign Lord Jesus, <clears throat> Sovereign Lord, I've lost my daughters. Lord, bring them to me. The Lord sees me as unprofitable servant. And he says, Sam, <clears throat> your pain is my pain. But trust me, trust me. I'm in control. They're in my hands. And you're in my hand. And nothing, not even corrupt lawyers, a wicked, filthy judge of the devil will ever separate you or my daughters, your, you and your daughters from my hand. Trust me. And you know what I say? Lord, of course I'm going to trust you. Of course I'm going to cling to you because you are the only hope I have. If I turn away from you, what do I have anymore? If I lose you, I lose everything. But if I have you and I lose everything, I have everything in you and because of you. I trust in you, Lord Jesus. I cling to you, Lord Jesus. I, I love you, Lord Jesus. Help me to love you perfectly, not fail you. Okay? So I hope that answered the question what the Bible is. The Bible doesn't make men more than they are. The Bible says even the best of saints can be the worst of sinners. And that even the holiest are not holy enough, and they need Jesus. You know what this shows you? You know what this shows you? Let me tell you what it shows you. If even John the Baptist, Abraham and Moses, Peter, Paul, and John can commit the most wicked of sins and have doubts and moments of weakness, that tells you that even the holiest of the holiest are not holy enough and they desperately need Jesus every second, every minute, because if Jesus lets them go, they're gone, and they'll turn away. And how does this now apply to you? If even the best of saints can fall into sin and momentary lapse of doubt and have weakness, and God still pity them, and God still mercy them, and God still forgive them and love them, then how much more you? who hasn't heard the voice of Jesus audibly or seen Jesus physically, but you still love him, you still cling to him, and you still trust in him. They saw Jesus physically. They heard Jesus audibly and doubted. So let me show you what Jesus says to Thomas. John 20, 27 to 29, and the statement from Peter, and I'll take a final question. John 20, 27 to 29. Exactly. Whom I have, whom do I have in heaven but you? John 20, 27, 29. Read this. Then saith he to Thomas, reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless but believing. Now notice what Thomas said. Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. Now notice Peter, Jesus' response. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Thomas, you had to see me physically for you to be convinced I am 
the Lord your God. Thomas, I tell you, there'll be folks who will not have seen me physically, but they will have believed that I am the Lord their God, and they are truly blessed. And then notice what Peter says in 1 Peter 1, verse 8. 1 Peter 1, verse 8. Watch here. 1 Peter 1, verse 8. We're going to take a final question because we're over two hours. Notice what Peter says. This one really moves me because Peter wrote it, and I'll watch what Peter says. This one should move you, folks. Listen to this. 1 Peter 1, verse 8. Talking to these Christians who have not seen Jesus physically. Notice what he says. Whom having not seen, ye love. In whom, though, now ye see him not, yet believing. Ye rejoice with joy unspeakable, full of glory. You understand Peter's words here? You haven't seen him, but you're so in love with him. You haven't seen him, but you have such faith in him. It's like Peter's almost moved, like, wow. Wow, you guys didn't see my Lord. And yet you love him. <clears throat> see, I'm about to cry again. You haven't seen my Lord, but you have such faith in him. I'm blown away. You know why? Because I can tell you how good he is. I saw my Lord. I heard my Lord. I used to sleep next to my Lord. My Lord used to hug me. My Lord used to kiss me in the head physically. I saw nothing but goodness and beauty and compassion from my Lord. I can't help but love him. And yet you haven't seen him and you love him just as much. You haven't seen him, and yet you have faith in him to move mountains. See, this is what Peter is like. Wow. I can tell you, if you met him, you can't help but fall in love with him. He's so good. He's so beautiful. He's so compassionate. He's so merciful. I denied him three times, and he never once condemned me, but he restored me by having me confess my love for him three times. I'm in love with Jesus. And you know what blesses my heart? It's what Peter's saying. You're in love with him too. See, this is why I said the goal, the goal of every true Christian teacher. You know what the goal is? Of every true Christian teacher is to bring people to fall in love with Jesus and see how beautiful he is. A true teacher will not bring people to himself or draw attention to himself. A teacher that's really used of the spirit will say, look at him. Look how beautiful he is. Look how amazing he is. Look how glorious he is. Look how humble he is. Look how compassionate he is. And see how much he's in love with you. See? That's the goal of every, every Bible teacher. So let me take a final question. There was one more question. What was it? Yes. John 20, 22 to 23. What was your question? Your question is about John 20, 22, 23, Horizon. But can you be more specific? Be more specific so I know how to answer this passage accordingly. And then I'll be done, folks. I hope you're blessed. And by the way, I'll ask this afterwards. And I'm going to give you... What's controversial? Well, yeah, it's not so much controversial because I'm going to just show it contextually and how you want to apply it. Because remember, Ariel, every passage has an historical contextual meaning, but then how do you apply it, right? Because it's not just for the apostles. We also have to see how it applies to us today. So what is said to the apostles, in many cases, by extension, will also apply to those who come after them. So how do you apply it? That's something you guys can debate. You and the Orthodox, hey, man, I'm just watching. I'm just on a path, bro. I'm a path, Ariel. Don't hate. Participate. But contextually, I'll explain to you what the Lord was saying. John 20, 22, 23. So what exactly are you asking me so I can know how to answer? What's your exact question? Because you just said John 20, 22, 23. You just want me to answer it in general? Okay, the contextual meaning. Let's go to John 20. Let's read. <clears throat> I'm drinking stupid meat. I'm drinking <clears throat> lemonade. John 20, 21 to 23. I don't know what your question is, Lewis. If it's a long answer, 
that instead of giving you a short answer, what if I send you a T-shirt? Instead of a short, maybe I send you a shirt. Okay, now read John 20, 21, 23. Let's wrap things up. John 20, 21, 23, read with me. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so <clears throat> send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Verse 23. Whosesoever sins ye remit. Whosesoever sins ye remit. Right? They are remitted unto them. And whosesoever sins ye retain, <clears throat> they are retained. So, Question, what does it mean when Jesus says, whomever the apostles forgive, they'll be forgiven. Whomever they don't forgive won't be forgiven. What does that mean? Okay, are you ready for the explanation, contextually, exegetically, how John understands it? Okay, number one, before I even show you what it means, I want you to see Jesus is God. He's the God of Genesis. Do you know why? Because notice in John 20, 22, Jesus breathed on them, received the Holy Spirit. Notice Jesus is breathing on them the Holy Spirit for spiritual life. Do you know why that's amazing? Because John is showing you the same God that breathed biological life into Adam by breathing the breath of life in his nostrils is now the same God in the flesh breathing new life, regenerate life to his disciples because he breathes out the Spirit. You guys catch that? Genesis 2, verse 7, Genesis 2, verse 7, the Lord God fashioned Adam from the dust of the ground, breathed into him the breath of life in his nostrils, became a living soul. John is saying, here is that God once again. Here is the Lord God, Jehovah God, that breathed the breath of life into Adam to make him a living biological being who's now breathing the Holy Spirit once again to give spiritual life and renewal to those who, who are dead spiritually. Yep, second creation, Lewis, the new creation. The same God who created the first creation is now recreating this fallen creation and turning dead people into new creatures living to God. Did you catch that? Did you catch that first point? Okay. Second point is this. Now I authorize you, now that you are empowered by the Spirit, now that I've made you spiritually alive and endowed you with the Holy Spirit to empower you and guide you, you will proclaim the gospel. And in proclaiming the gospel, you will tell people you believe you're forgiven. You reject, you are not forgiven, you remain in your sin, and you stay condemned. So contextually, the meaning is the Great Commission. Because what did he say? I'm sending you out. That's the key. John 20, 21. That's the key. It's talking about being sent in the life and power of the Spirit to preach the gospel, proclaim forgiveness or wrath. There it is right there. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. In the life of the Spirit, now your spiritual life, and in the power of the Spirit. So now I send you to proclaim to people, you believe in Jesus, you're forgiven. You don't, you remain in your sin, you're condemned to hell. John 20, 30 to 31. Now, what you extrapolate from that, that's something you decide. What do you extrapolate from that? That's between you and the Lord. I'm just telling you contextually. Here it is. John 20, 30 to 31. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Now notice, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. That's what he's saying. See, now I, John, who was made alive by the Spirit and in the power of the Spirit, sent by Jesus, I'm letting you know, you believe and receive, you have eternal life. But then notice what John says if you reject. Let's go to John 1, 12 to 13. John 1, 12 to 13. Who should write? I should write a commentary? Man, you guys are crazy, dude. John 1, 12 to 13. But as many as received him, this is John now, as many as received him, 
To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Okay, now the same John. Let's go to John 3, 16 to 18. John 3, 16 to 18. Believe Sharba means not only mental ascent. Yeah, Jesus. Meaning trusting in him, clinging to him, loving him, and obeying him. Sharba. Because true belief, because Sharba, you and I both know, right? There are many among our people say, I believe in Jesus, but live like the devil. No, no, that's not belief according to John. That's not believing, Sharbal, according to John. Believing according to John is Jesus is Lord, and I hope in him, I trust in him, I'm in love with him, and I do what he tells me to do. That's belief. Of course, Sharbal. Anyway, John 3, 16, 18. John 3, 16, 18. Let's read it again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. See? Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. John 3.36 Couple more and I'll wrap it up. John 3, verse 36. Zella, Zeli. Is that a guy's name or a girl's name? I don't know because there's a game called Zella. John 3, 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. That's how they forgave or did not forgive. Yep, I'm Assyrian, Ashuraya, Aturaya. Did you catch it? No, Lewis, I've already covered that in previous sessions. I don't have time. Next time I'll answer that, promise you, but time is up. Sorry, buddy. All right, just sorry. But again, you see how they forgave and not forgave? Believe in the gospel. You're forgiven. Don't believe. You remain your sin. You're condemned. You go to hell. So let's look at the epistle of John. The same John wrote the gospel, wrote the epistle. Let's go to 1 John 5, 9 to 13. 1 John 5, 9 to 13. So that's the contextual meaning. But what do you extrapolate from that? What do you draw from that? Well, again, others will draw that this means you can go to a priest and confess. You ask them for their view. I'm just giving you the context. I'm giving you contextual meaning. But obviously the Bible is written so that we can also see how it applies to us today and what we can draw and extrapolate from the commands given to the disciples, how they apply to us today, practical application. I'm just giving you the contextual meaning, though. Now read with me. 1 John 5, verses 9 to 13. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his son. Here's what God has testified about his son. Okay, read. Read with me. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. See, John is saying, you don't believe what God has said about Jesus? You turn God into a liar, and you're going to be condemned. See? He's now exercising his authority, right? <clears throat> so, because he believed not the record that God gave his son. Now notice 11. And this is the record that God hath given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Pay attention. He that hath the son hath life. And he that hath not the son of God hath not life. You're forgiven, and you will live forever if you have the son. You don't. You're dead. You're not alive. You're going to hell. There you go. Verse 13. Finally, verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. You see, John is telling me, you're forgiven. You have everlasting life. You believe in Jesus. You know, you're condemned. God's wrath is upon you. You have no life in you. You get the point? So that's the contextual meaning. What you extrapolate, what inference you make, how do you then apply it in your 
And practical application, how does it apply to us today? Again, different traditions will use that to draw different inferences. But I'm just giving you the contextual meaning, right? Because I'm trying to stay to exegesis and be as accurate to interpreting the Bible correctly by the grace of the Holy Spirit. So I'm just giving you the textual meaning. So I hope you got your answer, Isaac. Did I help you now? I just gave you the interpretation. And hey, a lot of snack bar. And hey, I just gave you the interpretation. The apostles were authorized to preach the gospel. And in proclaiming the gospel, say, you're forgiven when you believe. You remain in your sin, dead in your sin, under God's wrath if you don't believe. So you're jacked, off the hell you go. I just gave it to you, buddy. I love you, N.A. I hope that was clear. John 20, 21, 23, because you can't get around the fact it's in the commissioning of the apostles to preach the gospel, right? Because what did John 20, 21 say? As the Father sent me, so I send you. So that's talking about the commission, the ministry of proclaiming the gospel of salvation. Eddie, is he good looking like me, your brother? Is he good looking like me? Just want to make sure. Brother Charbel, believe it or not, if you preach the gospel, you too can say to someone, you have life in yourself if you're believing in Jesus, trusting him. Oh, you don't believe in Jesus? You're going to hell and you'll be under God's wrath. So when you say, can this also extend to priests? It can also extend to us who preach the gospel. I'm not putting myself on the level of priest, but you understand, Charbel, what I'm saying? Because what's the context, Charbel? Preaching the gospel. So I'm not an apostle. I'll never be an apostle, and I'll never be on the level of an apostle. But like the apostle, I can say, hey, you, Abdullah, you reject Jesus, you're going to hell, and you're going to burn in hell with your filthy Muhammad. But wait, what gives you that authority? The gospel that I'm preaching. Right? You with me there? Making sense? Mahmoud, Ayub, do you believe Jesus is Son of God? No. Do you, do you accept him? No. You're going to hell and you're going to remain in your sin like Muhammad is in hell, damned in, in hell. Under, you see the point? Does that make sense now? Okay, so... Hope that was clear, and I trust the Holy Spirit will save me from error. And if I make mistakes, may he remind me and show me what those errors are and correct them to me, never to repeat them, and save him from all errors. But anything that came from him, may he implant that in the depth of our being to fall more in love with Jesus, to be more in awe of Jesus, to live more faithfully for Jesus, to then proclaim Jesus more boldly, to know his word, live his word, love his word, proclaim his word, and die for his word. May Jesus increase in us. We love you, Bobby. Abba, we love you. Son of God, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Lord Jesus, cover us. Cover our loved ones. Cover my daughters who have not seen me and hugged me for over a year. Lord Jesus, how I ache for them. Cover them with your precious blood. Cover us by your blood, Lord Jesus, and seal us by your spirit. And Lord, please, before I die and come home to be with you by your grace, let me hold my daughters and kiss them and raise them to be queens in love with Jesus, that my daughters will grow up, if you tarry, to be more in love with the Lord and to do greater works for your glory, Lord Jesus, than their pitiful, sinful Baba. As long as they're in your hands, Lord Jesus, they are safe. And convict their mother, repent of her immorality, please, Lord, for the sake of my children. We love you, Son of God. We love you, Son of David. We love you, virgin-born Son of Mary the eternal Son of the Father, the eternal companion of the Holy Spirit. Lord, never, never leave us and give us the power to never leave you. Modern author, Lord, come sooner than later. We praise you, Son of God. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord willing, I may see you tomorrow if I do a live stream. It'll be probably around 4 p.m. between... Wait, no, no. Yeah, it'll be between... Yeah, between 7, yeah, 6.30, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Between 6.37 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Lord willing. Guys, I love you, but more importantly, Jesus loves you more. Finally, I want to ask you guys a question. Did my explanation of Numbers 31, 17, 18, Ariel, everyone else, earlier in the previous session, was that clear or did I confuse people? When I said Numbers 31, 17, 18, 
The word there for women is not the same. Because in Numbers 31, 17, 18, it says young women. So there was that qualifier, young, showing that they are premature, too young for marriage. So they take them in, not to have sex with them, but to engraft them into the commonwealth of Israel, raise them up as Israelite women. And then when they're mature, then you marry them. Because in Deuteronomy 21, it doesn't use the same term. It doesn't say young women. It says women. So the words for women is not the same in that in Numbers 31, 17, 18, it said young women, little women, but that qualifier does not appear in Deuteronomy 21. So that was clear as day. So no one can pervert that scripture, right? And make it sound like Muhammad and his God. If so, Lord bless you. Hit the like button. Rewatch these lessons. Pass them on. Excellent Q&A. God bless us with two excellent sessions. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Take care.